Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. Strings are an incredibly important part of the JavaScript language since they allow us to do things like work with individual letters as well as longer things such as words, sentences, paragraphs, and so on. Now we've already looked very briefly at strings when we were first learning the main data types in JavaScript, but what I want to do here is go a little bit deeper. So the structure of this uh, section is going to be like this. We're going to start off by taking a closer look at how strings really work behind the scenes in the JavaScript language. After that, we're going to see uh, some of the built-in methods that JavaScript provides for us. These are going to be very similar to what we've seen on, let's say, arrays or objects, where there are built-in methods on strings that make manipulating them a lot easier. And finally, we're going to close out with something pretty fun, which is we're going to see how to apply colors to strings when we print them out to the console in JavaScript. So that's our basic plan of attack. Let's jump right in. All right, so to get started here, what I want to do is make sure we're on the same page by going back and taking a look at the very basics of JavaScript strings. Now, some of this is going to be stuff that you've already seen if you've worked with JavaScript strings, but some of it is probably going to be new for you, so I'd recommend that you kind of uh, bear with me through the simpler parts here. So let's just start off by taking a look again at the main syntaxes for defining JavaScript strings. There are three main syntaxes, and you're probably already familiar with them, but again, I'm just going to cover them to make sure we're on the same page here. Uh, in JavaScript, the different syntaxes for strings are basically going to depend on what quotation marks you use to define the string. So. Uh, the most common one that you'll see is using single quotes, and this is usually going to depend on the developer's style, but single quotes are the most common ones that I see, and, you know, that can just be used to define a string in a pretty straightforward way, right? So you could just say hello, like so, and that would be a JavaScript string. Now, you could do the same thing by creating another string, which we'll call string2, and if you wanted to use double quotation marks to define a string as well, that would be the same thing. Now, the important thing to note in this situation is that there is no difference whatsoever between these two strings, right? String one and string two are going to be exactly equal to each other. And in fact, if you try and compare string one and string two, all right, we'll do that just by saying console.log string one is triple equals equal to string two. What you're going to see is if we run our code, it will say true, right? So there's no difference here uh, between our two strings if we define them with a single quote or double quotes. And there's actually a third way of defining strings in JavaScript, which again, you probably have seen already. I've, I think I've probably used it already in our examples. But once again, I'm just going to discuss this just to be thorough. Uh, and that third way of defining strings in JavaScript is using backticks, which is probably going to be in the top left-hand corner of your keyboard, or uh, if you have an ISO keyboard, it might be right next to the left shift key. But whatever the case, they look like this, right? They're just these little teeny uh, slash marks up at the top. So defining strings with the backticks is just another way of defining strings. And, you know, just like with the single quotes and double quotes, if we were to compare string three to any of these other strings, it would return true, right? These three strings are all going to be perfectly equal to each other. Now, you probably will find yourself wondering why it is that JavaScript provides these three different ways of defining strings, right? A lot of other programming languages just pick one of these things, like double quotes, let's say, and stick to that for defining strings. They might use single quotes then for defining individual characters and uh, back ticks for defining something else. But in general, a lot of other languages will just pick one of these things and stick to it. So the question is, why does JavaScript provide all of these different ways? Well, as far as the single quote and double quote thing, the main reason that these two syntaxes coexist alongside each other is really a because JavaScript has kind of developed over time without a central planner to say, OK, we're going to do just this syntax or just that syntax. And B, this does give you a lot of flexibility 
with the actual characters that are in your string, right? So let's say that you're about to type out a string that has a lot of apostrophes in it, all right? So that might look something like this, right? You could say let my string equals, and then you might wanna say it. All right, well, in this case, we have two apostrophes in the middle of our string here, but as you can see, they're kind of messing with the outside single quotes. In other words, we're using the same character here for both the apostrophes and the single quotes on the outside. Now, uh, one simple way to get around this in JavaScript would just be to change the outside quotes to double quotes, all right? So we could change them from single quotes to double quotes, and that would get rid of any errors, and it would prevent the single quotes here from interfering with the actual string definition. And the same thing applies, of course, in reverse, right? If you want to define a string that has a lot of double quotes inside of it, right? For example, if you want to print some kind of dialogue, like, hello, he said. Well, in this case, again, the double quotes inside the string are interfering with the actual definition of the string itself. So what you could always do in this case is just replace the outside double quotes with single quotes, and that would make it so that your string is completely intact with the double quotes inside of it. So really, you know, just look at it as a good thing that JavaScript provides both the single quotes and the double quotes for us to use because it allows you to do the same kind of thing. Now, the same thing applies with backticks. Let's say that you have some kind of string where you need both uh, single quotes and double quotes inside the string itself. So, you know, maybe this string here says, I'm a big fan of JavaScript, okay? Well, in this case, it's a little bit tricky because the double quotes and the single quotes are both part of the string itself. And as you can see, the single quote here is interfering with the outside definition. Now, in this case, there's really two things you could do. The first thing, and probably the easiest thing in many cases, would just be to change the outside quotes to back ticks. Now, the nice thing about back ticks is that they're generally not used inside of a string, right? I'm sure that there's one or two the concrete uses of back ticks in some kind of grammatical construction. But personally, I've never had to put back ticks inside a string. So that's one way to allow yourself to have both double quotes and single quotes inside the string without having to uh, do any kind of fancy stuff. Now, when I say fancy stuff, what I'm referring to is let's say you don't want to go this route and you don't want to use back ticks because either you can't find it on your keyboard or some other good reason, I'm sure. Well, in that case, what you would have to do is you would have to actually escape these characters. And what escaping means is you're basically just going to go and put a backslash character before any characters that you don't want to follow their normal JavaScript usage. So it's going to look something like this. All right. And make sure that is the backslash because the slash itself won't work. All right. So what the backslash tells JavaScript when it's inside a string is that Whatever character we're trying to type there shouldn't be interpreted in its normal JavaScript-y way, right? So uh, in the case of a single quotation mark, for example, and the same thing is true for double quotes, we're telling JavaScript, no, this is not the end of a string. We actually want this character to be part of a string. Now, in this case, if we were to print out the value of my string, we're going to see that that backslash doesn't actually show up, right? If we run our code here, we'll see that the backslash just becomes the single quote after the string is defined, All right? So this is purely just something to help us uh, insert certain characters into JavaScript strings. And those are called escape characters, by the way, presumably because they allow you to escape the normal functionality of what those characters are supposed to do in a string. All right, so anyway, the last thing that I want to review here, we've taken a look at the single quotes and double quotes. The back ticks have one special function for us, and that is that they allow us to insert the values of variables into a string. So let's say that we have some variables like string one and string two, and maybe we also have some other variables here like x, which is a number, and we'll say y, which is, I don't know, an array, all right? Now let's say that we want to insert these things into a string. Well. One way to do that is just to use the plus sign, right? So if you say something like, 
uh, string one plus string two plus x plus y. Well, that will work, right? It will add all of those three things together into a string automatically if we print that out. And you'll see that it says hello, hello, and then it will have x and then y will be added onto the end. That's just how adding an array onto a string looks. But in general, this isn't really the best way to do it because uh, especially when you're trying to define other pieces of the string, such as, you know, if you want to say the values are, and then basically what you have to do is close off the string and add a plus sign after that, right? It's just not really the cleanest way to go about it. And it can be somewhat error prone. And this is an example that we've taken a look at before, but if we were to have two numbers, let's say like X and Y, and we wanted to print out the sum of those things, if we say x plus y equals, and then add x plus y on the end, like so, then what we're gonna see is that those two things actually get interpreted as strings before their values are added onto the end of that string, right? So we see that it says 57, which is just five and seven mushed together instead of the actual mathematical sum. Now, uh, using the back ticks, this is a lot less ambiguous, right? If we replace this with a backtick string and what we can do instead is just say dollar sign and curly braces. This is how you insert the value of a variable or really any JavaScript expression into a backtick string. You can just say X plus Y and that will work more like what you would expect it to do, right? It'll say X plus Y equals 12. So anyway, those are the three main ways of defining strings in JavaScript. And as we've reviewed these, we've also reviewed the little details of each of the different syntaxes. So there's just a few more things that I wanna talk about before we move on to some of the more exciting string topics in JavaScript. The first thing I wanna talk about is the topic of string immutability in JavaScript. And that is kind of a long word here, so I'll just write that out, immutability. There we go. So string immutability in JavaScript stands in contrast to how a lot of other programming languages handle strings, right? right if you take languages like, let's say, uh, C++, right? In certain other programming languages, strings are not really their own data type, right? In other words, strings are really just arrays of characters. So, you know, if you have a string that's someone's name, like Sean, then really what's going on behind the scenes in that language is that it's just an array of individual characters, right? So you would have S, H, A, U, oops, I wrote the N too soon, there we go, and then N, <laughs> okay? So that's what would be going on behind the scenes. Now what that generally means in some of these other programming languages is that strings are mutable, right? So basically, just like how we've seen that in JavaScript, you can actually mutate individual elements of an array without changing the array itself, just by saying something like my array index two equals, I don't know, exclamation point, right? That will actually change that element in the array without changing the assigned value of the array itself, right? And as we've seen, this can cause problems when you try and use the const keyword because even though when you use the const keyword with an array or an object, it does prevent you from directly reassigning a value to that variable or constant, uh, but it doesn't actually prevent you from doing things like this. So anyway, coming back to the way that JavaScript deals with strings, Strings in JavaScript are immutable, hence the term string immutability. And what that means is that once you define a string, like we've done here and here and here, there, there isn't any way to modify that string without just completely getting rid of it and reassigning a string, right? So let's say that we wanted to add some extra characters onto the end of this string, string three here, right? We could say string three equals string three plus, and then, you know, uh, we could add an extra message on the end there, right? So as you would see, if we were to run this again, we would see that sure enough, string three would be modified, but the thing is that the actual value of this string behind the scenes 
hasn't been modified. Instead, the old string that was assigned to string three has been removed, right? Just completely deleted and a completely new string has been created in its place. All right, so that's kind of a subtle detail and it's not really one that you'll need to think of most of the time but people do ask about that and the long and short of it is that is that in javascript strings are immutable which means that you can't change a string right you can't just change a little detail about a string uh, like changing one character to another or inserting something into that string without just completely getting rid of that string and replacing it with a new string all right, so, you know, this does have some performance implications when you're working with very large strings, but uh, that's probably not something you'll need to worry about right now. So I just wanted to mention that. Now, another thing to keep in mind with JavaScript strings, and when I say to keep in mind, it's really just something to keep way in the back of your mind because it's not a detail you'll need to know most of the time, is that JavaScript strings are UTF-16 encoded. Now this is different from what you'll find in most other situations, right? In most other situations, you'll be dealing with UTF-8 encoding. Now, first of all, just to give you a very brief explanation of what these two things mean, uh, UTF-8 basically just means that each character in a string is stored as a single byte, right? So you'll have a single byte of, you know, eight bits. Let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there we go, eight. And that's how characters are stored behind the scenes. Now, in UTF-16, which again is what's used by JavaScript, we have not one, but two bytes for every character. So what this means is that this encoding is able to represent more characters, but seeing as though the majority of the situations that your JavaScript programs are gonna be interacting with will involve UTF-8, right? Let's say if you're reading from a file, if you're just reading from a text file, chances are that text file is usually UTF-8. That means that JavaScript behind the scenes has to convert that to UTF-16. And likewise, when you're trying to do something like write a JavaScript string to a regular file, uh, the process is gonna have to go in reverse. Now, this, again, can cause some performance issues. This is a, a pretty intensive thing that JavaScript has to do each and every time you want to interact with the outside world via strings, but that's just kind of how it is. So anyway, that's just something to keep in the back of your mind is that JavaScript strings are UTF-16 encoded instead of UTF-8, which basically just means that uh, for each character, there are two bytes instead of just one as with UTF-8. So anyway, those are the main details that I wanted to cover with strings just to make sure we're on the same page. And now we can actually start moving on to some of the more exciting string related topics. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've reviewed some of the introductory details of strings, as well as a few more that you probably didn't know before, the next thing that we're gonna do is take a look at some of the built-in string methods that JavaScript provides for us that will make working with strings a lot easier. Now, the first set of methods that we're gonna take a look at here with strings are methods that are similar, or in many cases, almost identical to corresponding methods that JavaScript provides for working with arrays. All right, so just to give you an idea of what we're gonna be doing here, if we have a string uh, called my string, we'll just call it that, and it's hello. Well, there are a lot of methods that we can use with this string that have very similar functionality to the same methods if we were to call them on an array. So, uh, you know, if we were to log out, let's say my string dot includes, H, right, capital H, well, this is gonna do pretty much the same thing as it did when we called includes on an array, right? It's just gonna tell us whether or not that string contains whatever this thing is that we're passing as an argument, right? And in this case, it's going to return true. So anyway, that's the kind of methods that we're talking about here, but before we get to some of the more in-depth methods, Let's start off by taking a look at how to access individual characters on a JavaScript string, right? So while we're comparing this to JavaScript arrays, I suppose I'll just create another array 
down here, we'll just say my array and uh, we'll just make it an array of numbers. All right. Now, in arrays in JavaScript, we've already seen that it's pretty easy to access individual elements of the array. We can do that just by saying my array and then using square brackets and referring to the index of that array, right? So if we want to access the first element, it's going to be zero. If we want to access the second element, one. If we want to access the third, it's going to be two and so on and so forth. All right. So uh, we've already seen how to do that when we talked about uh, the basics of JavaScript arrays. Well, with JavaScript strings, we can actually do more or less the same thing, right? So if we want to say my string index zero, and let's just log that out to see what that does. Well, what we're going to see is if we run our code, sure enough, that will return H for us. And, you know, obviously if we were to pick another index here, that will do the same thing, right? So if we pick uh, index five, that will give us the exclamation point. So this kind of thing works with strings in JavaScript, but more often what you'll see instead is a method called char at, right? Now what the char at method does, it does the exact same thing as the square brackets. And so if we say my string dot char at zero, for example, and run our code, we'll see sure enough that will display a capital H. So you might be wondering why there's this difference, right? Why would we bother having a char at method when we can just use square brackets? And the reason for that is that char at used to be the only way that you could access individual characters in a string, right? This square bracket notation um, is something that was added a little bit more recently than char at, but you know, just because many programmers are creatures of habit, you'll still see this char at thing used all over the place and the square bracket. I honestly don't see that used very much still with strings, even though, um, even though it's perfectly valid. So anyway, that's how to access individual elements in a string. But one thing to keep in mind is that even though the square bracket notation looks the same with strings as it looks like with arrays, it does not allow you to actually modify the string, right? So if we try and say my string index zero equals uh, y, let's say, well, in that case, we'll see that the first letter of the string uh, is still H, right? So that just kind of silently does nothing. And if you want to just print out the entire string, just to make sure, you'll see that sure enough, it just remains the exact same string. So again, even though this syntax is more or less the same as what you'll see with arrays, it does not actually do the same thing behind the scenes, right? Because strings are immutable behind the scenes as we discussed earlier. All right, so anyway, that's how to access individual characters in a JavaScript string. The next thing that we're gonna take a look at here is a method called concat. Now we've already seen concat with arrays. Basically what it does is it allows us to add extra elements onto an array, right? By saying something like myarray.concat, and then we can basically just uh, say, let's do four, five, and six, all right? And what that will do if we log out the result here is it will basically just return a new array that has all of the elements from the original array plus any elements that we've passed as this argument to dot concat. Now, strings also have a dot concat method and it basically does the same thing except obviously with strings. So if we were to say console.log my string dot concat and then we'll say, how are you? Well, what we're going to see there is that that will, sure enough, add the how are you string onto the end of our uh, original string, or rather it will return a copy, right? Because strings are immutable, calling my string dot concat doesn't actually mutate the string behind the scenes. It just returns a modified copy, right? It returns a completely new string that has both the original string and whatever we're concatenating onto the end of it uh, inside the string. So anyway, that's the concat method. So hopefully by now you're getting the sense that uh, JavaScript strings, there's a lot of things that you can do with them via methods that are very similar to what you can do with arrays. And, uh, you know, we've already looked at the char at method, as well as the square bracket notation for strings, which uh, was very similar to 
working with arrays. And we also saw the concat method, which allows us to combine one string with another string and form a completely new string that is basically the sum of both of those strings. So in addition to these concepts that we've already seen, uh, there are a number of other built-in methods that we can work with with strings, and I'm just going to list them off right here. And once I've done that, I'll show you some brief examples of how they work um, because they're pretty self-explanatory. So anyway, some of these extra methods that are similar to array methods are going to be methods like dot includes. We already talked about that one earlier. Basically, this one just allows you to see whether or not a string includes a given character or substring. We'll take a look at an example in a minute. Uh, we also have the index of method as well as the last index of method. And these ones, just like in arrays, are going to tell us where in a string a given substring or character can be found. Right, an index of is gonna start from the beginning, last index of is gonna start from the end. We'll take a look at that in more detail shortly. Um, additionally, we have a method called slice, which is gonna do something very similar again to arrays. It's gonna allow us to just get substrings from an existing string. And that's pretty much it as far as the different methods that are available on strings that mimic array methods. One last thing that we're going to take a look at as well, though, is a method that allows us to take a string and actually convert it into a corresponding array, right? So we could take a string like this one here and actually convert it into an array containing all of the characters, right? So here, let me try writing that again. There we go. H, E, and then you'd have L, L, O. All right, and that is a method called split, which we'll be taking a look at shortly as well. The nice thing about this method is it really does open up the entire array toolbox for us in terms of working with strings because it literally takes a string and transforms it into an array that we can work with, right? So we can uh, you know, use things like map or filter, or whatever, on that array. All right, so let's just go through these things in order real quick. I'm gonna show you an example of each of them, uh, and hopefully it'll be pretty straightforward. The the first of the methods that I just mentioned is the includes method. Basically, as we've already seen, this method allows us to tell whether or not a given string includes some sort of substring. So if we wanted to check and see whether or not our string included an exclamation point, we could just say my string dot includes, and then we could say exclamation point as the argument. All right, now this is going to return Oops, let's try running that again. There we go. This is going to return true, as you can see. And if we were to pass something, um, you know, pass a different sort of character that's not in the string, such as, uh, let's see, a capital X. Well, in that case, it's going to return false because that's not in our string. Now, a few things to note about this includes method as it relates to working with strings. The first thing is that it is case sensitive. So if we were to say includes and then pass a lowercase h, then this is going to return false as well because our string has an uppercase h. So in JavaScript, unless you explicitly convert a given string to lowercase or uppercase and you know compare two strings after they've all been converted to either lowercase or uppercase, JavaScript is going to be case sensitive, right? So, you know, if we were to say console.log and compare the string hello with a capital H to the string hello with a lowercase h, even though both of these strings are similar in every other way and even similar in the letters that they contain, this is going to return false, right? That's going to be the second false here because uh, those aren't equal. And this kind of logic extends into when you're using uh, methods like includes. Now, the second thing to keep in mind with the includes method when you're working with strings is that you're allowed to pass strings that are longer than just one character to it. So if you wanted to figure out whether or not this included, let's say, a double L, then you could just pass a string with two L's in it, right? And that's something that you can't really do with arrays because that's just not really how arrays work. In arrays, the two elements next to each other usually aren't related to each other in quite the same way that two letters are related to each other in a string. So uh, anyway, that's the second thing to keep in mind when working with includes with JavaScript arrays. 
Okay, and that's pretty much all you need to know about includes. So let's move on to our next string method, which is going to be index of. Now index of, this is something that we've taken a look at already with arrays. Basically, this method is gonna go above and beyond what we just saw with includes, which only returns true or false. And it's actually gonna tell you where in the string the substring is found. So let's try this again with, uh, we'll just use the capital H, saying my string dot index of capital H. What this is gonna return is zero. Now what this means is that not only was this string found, but it was found at index zero in our string. All right, and just like with includes, you can pass substrings here. So if you wanted to search for a double L, that's going to include the index of the starting point of this substring in the larger string, right? So this L here is at index two, and you know that's all it's really gonna tell you because that's all you need to know, right? If you really wanna know the index of the other letters, you can just add on to whatever this index is uh, for each of those elements. So anyway, that is the index of method in JavaScript. Now, one thing to notice about this is that even if there are multiple instances of a given substring inside a larger string, right? If we were to just search for L, there are two L's in this string, but if we run this again, we're gonna see that it will only tell us what the index is of the first L. And basically this goes back to what we saw with arrays as well. If we wanted to start our search from the back of the array, that's when we would use last index of instead. And as you'll see, that will return three because it starts from the back of the string and searches in the opposite direction. So it gets to the other L first. Anyway, that's just something to keep in mind. And just like with the index of methods on, uh, on JavaScript arrays, you can also pass a second argument that will tell index of where to start searching. So, so if you do have some kind of application where uh, you need to be able to find the positions of, of multiple occurrences of some substring in a larger string in JavaScript, you can use this second argument to do that, all right? It's just gonna be the number of the index that you wanna start your search at. Oh, and one last thing here is that if you happen to pass a substring that isn't in the string, then just like the index of method for arrays, it's going to return negative one. All right, so pretty consistent with what we've already seen with JavaScript arrays. So that's the index of and last index of methods that are available on JavaScript strings. The next method that we're gonna take a look at is the slice method, and this method is pretty much the same thing as we saw with arrays. It basically just allows you to get a substring of some larger string, and in order to do that, you pass two arguments. The first argument is the index you wanna start at, and the second argument is the index that you want to end the substring at. So, you know, if we wanted to get the middle of our string here, we would just say slice one and then five. And if we run our code now, what we'll see is that that gives us the middle of our string. And uh, just one thing I wanted to point out is that this second argument here is exclusive. All right, so it's not going to include whatever character is actually at index five. It's going to stop before index five as we've seen. Okay, so that's slice. Um, same details apply to slice with strings as slice with arrays. So I'm not gonna really discuss those any further. So let's move on to the final array method that we're gonna take a look at here. And, and this one isn't a method that JavaScript strings have in common with JavaScript arrays. Instead, as I've already mentioned, it's a method that allows us to take a string and transform it into an array in some specific way. So. That method, by the way, is the split method. Now, the simplest thing that you can do with this split method is pass an empty string. And in that case, what will happen if you run this is it will basically just take whatever string you're calling dot split on and split it apart into a series of single character strings, right? So it's basically just going to give you an array of all of the actual character strings from the larger string, right? So H, E, L, L, O, and exclamation point. Now, as I mentioned before, this is a good way to get access to some of the methods that are available on JavaScript arrays, but that don't have a corresponding method on JavaScript strings, right? So for example, the map method, right? Which allows us to basically transform each element in an array in some way 
isn't available by default on a string, right? If we wanted to capitalize every other letter in the string and leave the other ones lowercase, then that would look something like this. We could just say X, right? Which would be the actual letter in the string and I, and then we would just check to see whether or not I is divisible by two by saying I modulus two is equal to zero. If so, we would return whatever letter that is converted to uppercase. Otherwise, we would return whatever letter that was converted to lowercase. All right, now this is great, but it won't actually work because again, strings don't have a built-in map method. So what we could do if we really wanted to use map on this string to transform each of the characters is we could just split it apart by saying dot split with an empty string as the argument and then we would be able to use map. And as we could see, if we run this, sure enough, it will give us an array of all of the letters and each of the letters will have been transformed in the way that we specified. Now, this does call into question how we actually take an array of letters like we have here and bring it back together into a single string, right? So after we've made our map transformation or filter transformation or whatever it is we're trying to do with map, how do we get that back into a single string? Well, this is actually pretty straightforward because split has a sort of opposite method, which is called join. All right, so if we say dot join, and we have to call this one with an empty string as well. I'll explain what the empty string is for in just a minute here. But if we run our code now, what you'll see is that sure enough, that takes that array of characters and puts it back together into a single string. Uh, with those existing transformations that we made. Okay, so let's talk in more detail about what this argument is that we're passing to split and the other method that we just looked at, which is join. Basically, this tells JavaScript where we want to split our string apart, all right? So in other words, it tells JavaScript what character we want it to look for in order to tell where those split points should be. So. If we pass just an empty string with no space or anything in it, what JavaScript is gonna do, as we already saw, is split it apart character by character and just give us an array of all of the characters in that string. Now that's not always gonna be what we want, right? If we have a string that's like, hello, my name is Sean, for example, then we might wanna split this string apart into individual words instead of into individual characters. Well, in that case, all we would have to do is specify a different character as the argument to split, right? So if we wanted to uh, split this string apart by spaces, all we have to do is specify the space character as the argument here. And if we uh, just remove map here and join, just so you can see the example better, if we run our code now, sure enough, we'll see, hello, my name is Sean, right? So basically our string has just been split apart by whatever this character is. Now, you might wanna split it apart by commas. This is pretty common when you're doing something like parsing a CSV file, for example. And in that case, JavaScript is just going to look for the comma character and split apart elements by that character. So if we run our code again, we'll see, hello, and then my name is Sean as separate elements. Now, one thing to notice here is that when you call split, JavaScript actually is going to remove whatever character you're splitting on. So in this case, we were splitting on this comma character, right? We wanted to split apart, hello, my name is Sean, by the comma character. And notice down here that the comma has been completely removed, right? It's just not there anymore. And that's how split works, right? It basically just goes in there. When it finds that character, it's going to remove that character and everything that's left over is going to fall now into different elements in the final array. And by the way, the reverse applies to join, right? So if you were to uh, split the string apart by spaces, let's say, and then call dot join and join it back together with a dash character, well, what that's gonna do is it's going to give you all of those individual words reconcatenated together with a dash, right? Right, and you can use pretty much any character or string or whatever here that you want, right? You could put, I don't know, a bunch of exclamation points. And if you join your string back together like that, this is what you're gonna get with all of those exclamation points between hello, my name is, and Sean. All right, so again, the split and join methods are very useful. And one last thing that I just wanna point out, it's really just a little nitpicky detail, but, um, I don't want you to get the wrong impression. Join is actually an array method, right? It's not 
a string method. And you can see this by the fact that my string dot split returns an array, right? And we're calling dot join on that array, which means that join is an array method instead of a string method. So that's just something I wanted to point out. Um, split is a string method and join is an array method. So anyway, those are really the main methods that you'll be working with in strings that are similar to array methods. And the split thing doesn't itself have an analog in the array world, but I wanted to mention it anyway because it allows us to transform our strings into arrays in the first place. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've covered a lot of the nitty gritty details of strings in JavaScript and we've seen a lot of the built-in string methods that are provided for us, the last thing that I wanna do here is have a little bit of fun and show you how to actually apply color to your strings in JavaScript so that when you print them out to the console, they'll have some more exciting colors than just printing out in either white or green as we've seen before. Right, if we run this now, we'll see that that's a pretty boring result. So in Node.js, the main way that you're going to add color to your strings when you print them out to the console is using an NPM package called chalk. All right, so chalk is basically just a simple NPM package that, that provides an interface for adding color to strings that we're about to print out. So to get started here, you're, go you're gonna wanna make sure that whatever directory you're working in and writing your code in is itself an NPM package, right? It should have a package.json file. It if it doesn't, you're just gonna to wanna to generate one by saying npm init-y. And don't worry, by the way, if you don't have all these other files that I have here, these are from some other sections that I've been recording. So the only thing you're gonna to have to worry about here is this package.json file. And again, if you don't have that, just run npm init-y, and that will generate one for you. So anyway, once you've done that, you're gonna to want to install the chalk package into your project by saying npm install chalk. All right, C-H-A-L-K. Weird word, I myself had to check the spelling for this one, but that's how it is. So let's hit enter now, and we should have the chalk package installed into our project. So now that we have that installed, let's just take a look at how chalk works. Basically what chalk does is it provides us with a series of different functions whose names are different colors that we might want to apply to different pieces of a string, right? So we might have red, blue, green, and there's lots of other ones as well, as you'll see. Um, but basically these functions, what we can do is we can use them to wrap different strings in JavaScript. And when those strings are displayed to the console, right? So if we say red, hello, for example, when this is displayed to the console, it will actually have the color that we added to it right here. So what this is gonna look like, first of all, we need to import chalk into our project and you can either do that by saying let chalk equals require chalk or if you have your project set up to work with the import export syntax which we talked about elsewhere you can just say import chalk from chalk okay so now that you have chalk imported we can apply different colors to different parts of our strings simply by calling chalk's different functions, which we can access by saying things like chalk.red, chalk.green, and, and you can actually see all of the options that are available here depending on your IDE settings uh, by just typing a period after chalk and taking a look at, at the different available functions, right? So in addition to some of the more obvious ones like blue and red and whatever, there are also these BG functions. And basically what those allow you to do is set a given background color on a certain string, right? So I'll show you what that looks like in a second. But first of all, let's just start off by applying some simple colors to our existing string. We're just gonna say, let my string equals chalk dot red. And we'll say, hello, like so. And then we'll add that on to another string where we'll say chalk dot blue and we'll have my name is, and then last but not least, we'll add on Sean, and we'll just say chalk dot, and we'll use green for that one. In fact, let's use BG green, which will set the background of that to green, and 
there we go. All right, so at this point we have a colorized string. So if we print out this string with console.log, right, if we say my string like so, then what's gonna happen if we run our code here, there we go, is, oops, it looks like I got an error because I used import without adding something to the package.json. So I'm just gonna change that to require for now, just because that's more straightforward. So we'll say let chalk equals require, and then we'll say chalk. All right, so if we run this again, oops, and it looks like I got an error that says cannot use import statement outside of a module. Uh, and that's just because we need to go into package.json and add the key type and module, right? And that will make the import syntax work. So let's try running this again. And sure enough, what we'll see is that it says, hello, comma, right? That's red. And my name is, is in blue. And then Sean has a bright green background. So anyway, this is kind of a fun thing to play around with. It's definitely something that you see quite a bit uh, whenever you run a terminal command or and even whenever you do something like install an NPM package, right? You can see that there's quite a bit of color going on and by using a package like chalk, you can actually start to add that to your own scripts, right? So, uh, you know, if you're doing something like starting up a server, instead of just printing out a boring message that says server is listening like so, you can actually colorize it a little bit by saying chalk dot uh, green, we'll do BG green, let's say. Server is listening. And if we run this code again, you'll see that that is, well, in my opinion anyway, that's a little bit more exciting than just having your plain white text. So anyway, just a few more things to know about the chalk package. Um, I really recommend that you explore it on NPM, by the way. You can just get there by searching for chalk on NPM and uh, finding this page should be pretty easy to find. You can see that it's a pretty popular package just by the number of weekly downloads here. Um, and it also shows you basically all of the different things you can do, right? So you can add an underline, you can, uh, there is somewhere where you can add bold. Basically, it just shows you examples of everything that you can do with the package. So anyway, feel free to explore that package and use it in all of your future uh, scripts that you write. It's not a necessity, but it does tend to make things a little bit more fun, I've found. So anyway, that's the chalk package. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. Compared with a lot of other programming languages like C++ or Java or Python, in JavaScript, functions tend to play a much larger and slightly different role. So what this means is that in order to gain a mastery of the JavaScript language, you're really gonna have to gain an in-depth understanding of JavaScript functions, as well as how they fit into JavaScript programs. And as you might've guessed, that's what we're gonna be taking a look at here. So we're gonna be taking an in-depth look at JavaScript functions and some of the peculiarities about them. And without further ado, let's jump right in and see what this is all about. Okay, so to get started here, the first thing that I wanna do is review the basic syntax or syntaxes of functions in JavaScript, right? And this is something that we took a look at in a previous section, but I just wanna review it here to make sure we're on the same page. So in JavaScript, there are three main ways of defining functions, and this still confuses some people because really two of these ways are what I refer to as the old way of doing things and the new way is, well, a way that some people still aren't comfortable with in JavaScript for one reason or another. So anyway, the three ways of defining functions in JavaScript are, first of all, using the function keyword, you know, by saying something like function, my function, and then taking some arguments of some kind and returning some sort of value. All right, so this is the first way of defining functions in JavaScript, and this is probably I wanna say the oldest way and still one of the most common ways of defining functions in JavaScript, right? So this is uh, syntax number one, we'll call it. The second main way of defining functions in JavaScript is similar to the first way, but instead of using the function keyword first, right? And defining the function by saying function, my function, blah, blah, blah. We instead define it more like a variable, right? So we would say something like let 
my function, and I'll have to call this my function too so that it doesn't collide with this existing my function, of course. But then we would just say equals function, and then of course we would define whatever functionality we want the function to have, right? So it would take arguments, it could return a value of some kind, and this here is what I refer to as syntax two. Right now, first of all, there are some important differences here between syntax one that we just took a look at up here and syntax two, right? Even though these are gonna do pretty much the same thing, and here I can make this do exactly the same thing if we just return a plus b in both of these instead of uh, a times b. So right here, these two functions are gonna do exactly the same thing if we call them, right? If we say my function, uh, you know, I don't know, five and six, and my function two, five and six, there's really no difference in the way that we call these. And as we're gonna see, these both will give us the exact same result, right? If we log out the result of calling both of these things and run our code here by saying node index.js. And by the way, I'm just in a basic folder here with an index.js file where I'm writing my JavaScript. So if you wanna follow along, all you have to do is just create a new directory and create an index.js file inside of there. So if we run our code here, we'll see that both of these give us the exact same result. Now, the main difference between these two ways of defining functions, however, is that functions defined in this first way, right, using syntax one, are hoisted, right? Now, what does hoisting mean? Well, basically, hoisting means that no matter where we define this function in the file, we'll still be able to call that function above where it's defined, right? So, well, we saw that calling my function and my function two here, right, defined with syntaxes one and two respectively, well, we saw that calling those two functions here worked perfectly fine if we were to move these function declarations down below where we wanna call them, right? So if we were to say my function, my function two, before we've actually defined my function and my function two in the code, right? In other words, on higher lines than where we actually define the functions. What we would see is that the first function, right? The function defined using syntax one would work, right? We would see that that would work perfectly fine and it would print out the answer 11, right? Five plus six. However, what we would see is that my function two, when we try and call this, this gives us a reference error saying that my function two hasn't been initialized, right? And basically what this means is that JavaScript doesn't yet know what my function two is because functions defined in any other way besides this first syntax here are not hoisted, right? In other words, only functions defined by saying function and then the name of the function are hoisted and can be used above where they're defined in the code, okay? So functions defined in this other way cannot do that. So anyway, those are the first two syntaxes of defining functions in JavaScript. And up until fairly recently, right, not super duper recently, but up until fairly recently, these were the only ways of defining functions in JavaScript. However, somewhat more recent versions of JavaScript have added a new syntax for defining functions whose main purpose is to make the process of defining functions use less code, right? So it's meant to just simplify the syntax, and there are a few extra details that are different as well, but we'll cover those elsewhere. So the way that we define this third syntax is gonna look something like this. We're gonna say, let my function three, right? So right away, this new function syntax is defined in a similar way to syntax two, where we define it as a variable. But then instead of using the function keyword, we're simply going to use parentheses that will accept any arguments we want the function to take, right? So this can be A and B. And then we're gonna have this little arrow thing that's made of an equal sign and a greater than sign. And that's gonna be followed by curly braces, okay? And this is where we have the body of our function. So if we wanted to make this do the same thing as our other functions, right? My function and my function two, then that would look like this, right? We would just say, let my function three equals, and then we have our little arrow function syntax here is what this is called. And then we define what the function actually does inside the function body. So if we try and call this function now, we'll see that this acts in pretty much the same way as our other functions, right? So we'll say my function three, five, and six, and we'll see if we run our code. 
that all of these functions will give us the exact same result. Okay, now again, the main difference between the arrow function syntax, which is what this is called here, and the older function syntaxes, right, syntax one and syntax two here, the main difference is A, it doesn't use the function keyword, and therefore it's a little bit easier to type, right? This kind of function syntax is especially helpful when we're doing things like working with arrays, right? If you want to use a function like map that requires you to pass a function as an argument, this arrow function syntax is definitely a lot more concise for those cases. It allows you to, in many cases, write all of your code on one line instead of having to use the messier function syntax uh, using the function keyword up here, right? So anyway, we have here the three main syntaxes for defining functions, right? We have syntax one, syntax two, and syntax three, which is called arrow function syntax, right? And as we saw, the main difference between these three syntaxes is, is that functions defined with syntax one are hoisted so they can be used above where they're defined in code. And that's not true of functions defined using syntax two or of functions defined using the arrow function syntax. Now, I do want to go a little bit more in depth with the arrow function syntax because there are some interesting cases where we can actually shorten the syntax for arrow functions even more. So let's just do that here. We'll create a new function. We'll say let my arrow function and then we'll say equals and in here we'll just define our arguments, right? So in the case where our function body only has one line and we want to return the value of that line, then what arrow function syntax allows us to do is actually remove the return keyword altogether and we can remove the curly braces as well, which gives us this really nice compact way of defining functions, right? So this may be something that you saw elsewhere uh, when we were working with built-in array functions such as map. If you had an array of, let's say, numbers, right? We'll say let numbers equals one, two, three. And you wanted to get another array that had each of the elements from this numbers array doubled or tripled or minus one or something like that. You could get that simply by saying numbers.map. And then you had to specify a function that told JavaScript how you wanted each of those items transformed, right? So if you wanted it doubled, you could say x, x times Two. All right, and this here would give us another array that would contain all of the original numbers in our numbers array doubled, right? In other words, where each element had been multiplied by two. All right, and don't worry too much if you're not already familiar with the map function. Um, the main point here is that the arrow function makes this much more concise than if we had to write out the same thing using the other function syntax, right? We would have to say function x, and then we would have to say return x times two, right? And that's quite a bit more verbose than just being able to say what we did before. So anyway, that's a very helpful thing that arrow function syntax allows us to do. It allows us to shorten it in a lot of situations. And another thing that it allows us to do is if our function takes one and only one argument, right? In other words, this doesn't apply if it takes zero arguments or if it takes two or three or more arguments. It only applies if it takes one and only one argument. In that case, all we have to do is say the name of the argument without parentheses, right? So in other words, JavaScript allows us to remove the parentheses when there's only a single argument in our arrow function. All right, so this function here, of course, would take something and double it. So if we were to say uh, my arrow function 10 and log out the result of that, this would, of course, give us 10 doubled, which would be 20, okay? All right, now, one more special case with the arrow function that I don't think I've ever mentioned before is that if you're returning an object from this arrow function, right? Let's say uh, you wanna create a function that will take a person's name as an argument and it will return an object that would look something like this, right? That would have the person's name as a property and then maybe it would have age set to zero initially, right? Something like that. Well, in that case, if you wanted to return an object from an arrow function using the shortened syntax without the return keyword, your first inclination might be to do something like this, right? You might try and say return, and then you have an object where you say name, name, just by some of the optimizations that JavaScript object syntax provides us with. 
And then if you wanted to set age to zero, you could just say age zero. Right now, the problem with this, as you can see by the little uh, red squiggly line underneath age, is that JavaScript doesn't quite know what's going on here, right? Because of the way that JavaScript syntax works with arrow functions, JavaScript thinks that this thing here is supposed to be a function body, right? In the same way that if we wanted to, uh, you know, log something out by saying console.log hello, and then return something, right? Like return goodbye. In other words, JavaScript thinks that this kind of thing is what we're trying to do when we immediately put curly braces after the arrow function. So if we wanna return an object like we saw here, all we have to do with the arrow function in this case is surround that object in parentheses, right? So if we put parentheses around this, JavaScript will know what we mean, right? It'll know, okay, cool, this thing inside here is an object instead of a function body. All right, so just to review all of the basic syntaxes of the arrow function, let's just go through this again. If we have a function where the function body has multiple lines and multiple arguments, what that would look like is we would say let my function equals, then we would say a, b, and oops, we need the arrow after those arguments here. And then we would have curly braces and we could say, you know, console.log hello. And then we could return whatever we wanted the return value of the function to be. Okay, now some of the simplifying cases as we saw were if we only have one statement in our function body and that's the return statement, what we can do is we can drop the return keyword and the curly braces. So that would look like this. We could say my function two equals a b and then a plus b which of course we could just move up and put on the same line with everything else, although you don't have to. All right, a further simplification that we saw is that if a function only has one argument, then what we can do is we can actually remove the parentheses around it, right? So if we wanted to double a number, what we would do is we would say a, a times two, and this would be the same thing as if we did the much longer version of saying function double, or whatever we want to call it, a return a times two. All right, and finally, if you want to return an object, which we'll represent by saying my function four, if you wanted to return an object of some sort, we'll just return an object with the property name equal to a, then you just have to put parentheses around that object. And this only applies if you're not using the return keyword, right? If you used the previous simplification that we saw up here. Now, as we've seen here, there are multiple different simplifications and they don't all have to go together, right? For example, if we had a function with a much longer function body, but that function only took one argument, then we would only apply the one argument simplification here and we would still leave the entire function body with the return keyword, right? So if we were to say, let my function, we'll just call this my function five equals, and then we wanted to say a, and then inside here, we wanted to do some stuff like console.log hello, and then return a times two, right? In this case, we're only removing the parentheses and we're still using the curly braces and the return keyword, right? So in other words, these simplifications that we've talked about don't all have to go together at the same time. Now, obviously the biggest benefit and the least amount of typing comes when you use them all at the same time, but that's only going to happen in a handful of very simple situations. Again, like where you're using uh, functions like map or filter. So anyway, hopefully this has been a helpful review of the many different syntax rules regarding functions in JavaScript. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've talked about JavaScript function syntax in all of its little details, the next thing that we're gonna talk about is how to work with function arguments in JavaScript functions without referring specifically to each individual argument. All right, now that probably sounds a little bit confusing, so let me just show you what situations this kind of thing is gonna be used in, and then I'll show you what the syntax actually looks like and some of the special concepts that JavaScript provides us with. 
So first of all, let's assume that we have a function in JavaScript, and I'm gonna use the first syntax here because what we're about to learn about doesn't work with arrow functions, and I'll show you what that looks like a little later on as well. So let's say that we're just defining a function that gives us the sum of a series of numbers, right? So let's say that we want this function to be able to give us the sum of five numbers, and therefore we have five arguments, A, B, C, D, and E. Well, implementing the functionality of this function here is pretty straightforward. All we need to do is say, return A plus B plus C plus D plus E, okay? And then of course, if we wanted to call the function, all that we're gonna have to do is call sum and then just pass whatever numbers we want to add together as arguments to the function. So if we run our code now, what we'll see is that this gives us the result that we were hoping for, right? This is gonna give us 15, which is the sum of all of these numbers that we passed. Now, here's the problem with this kind of function though, right? Let's say that instead of adding five numbers together, right, which is a pretty specific situation that's gonna call for that, let's say we want this sum function to be able to add any number of arguments together, right? So we want it to be able to add two arguments together in just the same way as we want it to be able to add 10 arguments together. Well, first of all, let's take a look at what happens if we just try and call this sum function without one of the extra arguments, right? So we're only passing four arguments here when really there are five specified. So in other words, we're not passing argument E. If we run our code now, what we'll see is that we get not a number. Now the reason this not a number result happens is because well, A, B, C, and D, those are all specified. A is one, B is two, C is three, D is four. But E, the default value for arguments in JavaScript that haven't been specified, as we have done down here, is undefined, right? So in other words, any argument that isn't passed is going to have this undefined value. Same as if you declare a variable and don't assign any value to it or you know, if you try and get the return value of a function that doesn't use the return keyword, okay? So what's happening here is once we get to plus E, right? In other words, we've already added these four numbers up, which gives us 10. Then we're trying to do 10 plus undefined, and that of course gives us not a number as pretty much any numeric operation in JavaScript will if you try and perform it on things that aren't numbers, okay? So that's what's going on here, and that's why we're getting this not a number result, which obviously isn't what we want, right? If we want our function to be able to add any number of arguments together, having not a number when we don't pass the exact number of arguments obviously isn't an option. So let's take a look also at the situation where we pass too many arguments, right? If we pass the argument five, so E, what do you think is gonna happen if we pass another argument six, right? There's no argument specified for this up here. Now, what a lot of you might be expecting, especially if you're coming from languages like Java or C++, which were much more strict about this kind of thing, what many of you might be expecting to happen here is for JavaScript to throw an error. However, what JavaScript is gonna do is it's just going to straight up ignore that argument, right? So we could have passed anything we wanted here. We could have passed a string, we could have passed an object, we could have passed an array, we could have passed another function. JavaScript doesn't care, right? Because unless we've specified an argument up here that matches the position of this argument when we call the function, nothing is gonna be done with that argument, right? It's just gonna be kind of off in the background taking up space. All right, so we saw that neither of these situations is really handled very well by JavaScript's default argument structure. So what JavaScript allows us to do in situations like this, where we just wanna be able to access all of the arguments, well, in that situation, JavaScript provides us with an object that we can access inside any function that's called arguments, right? And when I say that this can be accessed inside any function, that is excluding arrow functions, right? This arguments thing does not work the same way with arrow functions, and I'll show you that in just a minute here, if you're curious. But basically what this arguments thing here is, is an array-like object, and the reason I say array-like object instead of array, you'll see that in just a minute here, 
But basically, this is an array-like object that contains all of the arguments that have been passed to the function and their positional values, right? So it'll tell us, you know, not only what arguments were passed, but also what order they were passed in. Now, the interesting thing about this arguments object here, and first of all, this arguments thing is a lot like some of the other things we've seen in JavaScript, like console, where you can just call console.log, even though we haven't actually defined console in our program. That's what's referred to as a global object. Arguments here is a little bit more of a local object. In other words, it's only referring to the arguments of the specific function that we're using it inside of. Now, the interesting thing about this object is that it's going to give us the same result regardless of what arguments we've actually defined up here in the function's parentheses. So in other words, we could just remove all of the arguments and leave our function with empty parentheses. And when we call that function with some arguments like this, the arguments object is going to behave in the same way, right? So the arguments object here doesn't really care at all about what arguments we've technically defined up here in our function's parentheses. It's only going to refer to what arguments were actually passed to the function. So if we run our code now, what you'll see is that arguments here, as I said, is an array-like object that contains the values of all of the arguments that were passed, right? So notice here that this is just an object with the keys 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, sort of like you'd see in an array, except in an array, these keys are actual numbers. And for each of the values of those keys, we have the actual argument that was passed. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So what this allows us to do in JavaScript functions is it allows us to work with our arguments as if they were an array. So if we wanted to get the sum of our arguments here, what we could do is simply calculate that by using a for loop, right? So we could say let total equals zero. And then we could loop through our arguments by saying for let x of arguments, okay? And then in here, we're gonna say total plus equals x. And finally, we'll say return total. Now, if we run our code now, what you'll see is that everything works just the way we wanted it to. Now, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that this arguments thing, by default, is not actually an array, right? It's actually an object with the keys 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Now, if you wanted to convert arguments into a specific array, for example, if you wanted to call arguments.map, right? And uh, just as a side note here, if you call arguments.map and try and do something with that, like say x, x times 2, what you'll see if you run the code is that that will actually give us an error saying that arguments.map is not a function. And that's again, because arguments here isn't actually an array. Now, if you do want to convert arguments into an array, probably the easiest way to do that is just to say object.values arguments, right? Since what that will actually do if we scroll back up here, is it will just give us the values in an array, which is the exact array that we're looking for, right? So it gives us the arguments in an array when we call object.values, blah, blah, blah. And if we try that on here, right? If we say let x of object.values arguments, like so, we'll see that that will give us the exact same result. And of course, if you wanted to use map here, like if you wanted to double all of the numbers before, adding them together, you could say map x, x times two, and you'd see that that would successfully double all of the numbers before adding them. So anyway, that's how to use the arguments object inside of our functions. And now that we've talked about this, I actually wanna show you a way of doing this that's even easier. And this is a more recent addition to JavaScript. So, uh, you know, if you learned JavaScript a while back, you may not have seen this already, but basically you can do the same kind of thing that we can do using this arguments object in JavaScript simply by using the spread operator, right? Basically what the spread operator allows us to do when we use it in a function's parentheses is it allows us to get all of those arguments as an array, right? So if we say dot, 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 and here that wouldn't be sum, that would be like numbers, that's gonna give us an array containing all of the arguments that we've passed to that function, right? So if we log out our numbers here, and run our code, what you'll see is that that is truly an array containing the values one, two, three, four, five, which are the arguments that we called it with here, right? And of course, you know, if we were to call 
sum with a different number of arguments, right? If we were to say sum high by, that would work as well, right? The only difference is that numbers is going to be an array now containing the values high and by. So this is a much easier and arguably less error prone way of getting an array of all of the arguments. Because first of all, unlike with the arguments object, this numbers thing actually is an array. And second of all, it's a little bit nicer to look at the parentheses of a function like this one and actually see that it, that it takes an indeterminate number of arguments like this one instead of just having to read through the body and look for arguments as you would have had to do in the other case. So anyway, now that we've done this, we can actually create this function if we say let total equals zero and then loop through our numbers by saying for let x of numbers and then we could say total plus equals number, or x rather, total plus equals x, and then return total. We would see that, of course, uh, after removing the strings, we would see that this sum function would now work for any number of arguments, right? And in fact, it would even work for zero arguments. Here, if we just log out the results of each of these here, just give me a second to do that. Console.log sum, console.log sum, and console.log sum. If we run our code now, we'll see that our sum function works for all of those in just the same way as it would have if we had done the same kind of thing using the arguments object. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so the next topic that we're going to talk about related to JavaScript functions is the topic of default arguments, right, or default parameters in JavaScript. Now, in order to illustrate what default arguments are going to allow us to do and what the syntax for them looks like, what I'm going to do is define a simple function, and I'm going to use the arrow function syntax here, but it doesn't really matter which syntax you use. The concepts here that we're going to talk about will work regardless of what function syntax you use to define your function. So if we define our new function here, we'll call it something like let, and let's make this function double a number. But the trick here is that it's going to take the number that we want to double as its first argument, and as its second argument, it's going to expect us to pass in the number of times that we want to double that number, right? So in other words, if we pass one, that would be equivalent to just doubling this once. If we were to pass two, it would double this twice and so on. All right, so here's what that function would look like. It would be pretty straightforward. We would just say let result equals x, and then we would have a for loop that would loop through this number of times here. And just to show you a handy shortcut trick for doing that, uh, we could say for, let y of, and then we could say new array number of times, and then we could use dot fill to fill that array. All right, this is basically just creating a new array with this many empty elements inside of it. And the elements themselves don't really matter because we don't need y. In this case, this is being used just to make sure that the for loop loops through this number of times, all right? And for each of those, we're gonna say result times equals two, all right? So we're doubling result each and every time uh, for this many times. And by the way, we don't even need this y thing either. So what you'll sometimes see in JavaScript is people will just say let underscore of new array and this underscore character just kind of means we don't need it, right? And you can do a double underscore if you're already using the Lodash library, which, which just by convention uses the underscore character to call the library, but you know, it doesn't really matter which way because we're never gonna use this, right? You could call it something like never used if you really wanted to. But anyway, we'll just use the underscore character. And then finally, we would say return result. Well, this function is gonna work just fine. And we can see this if we log out the result of calling double on, I don't know, let's uh, start with 10 and we'll say that we wanna double it two times. If we run our code now, what we'll see is that we get 40, right? 10 doubled once is 20, 20 doubled is 40. Now the interesting thing about this function though, is its potential functionality 
right? The ability to double a number some number of times is most likely not what it's going to be used for a good portion of the time, right? Right, a lot of developers will probably just call double and they'll only want to double that number once, right? So if we were to pass one as the second argument, that would be the result, right? We'd get 20. Now in situations like this, there are a lot of situations that you're gonna run into like this where you know the second and maybe even third and fourth and so on arguments in a function are really there just kind of as backup if extra functionality is needed. All right, and that's very much the case here where really this is just used for a certain subset of specific situations. And most of the time what that means is that we're gonna want number of times to be one and we're only really gonna care about passing the first argument here. So again, in situations like this, in order to avoid forcing developers to specify the same value for that argument over and over and over again, in this case, it would be double 10, one, double five, one, double 3000, one, right? It's always gonna be one as that second argument. What we can do is we can provide a default value for this argument, which will make it so that if we don't pass the argument at all, this argument will still have a value and not end up as undefined, as we saw was the default in JavaScript if you reference an argument that hasn't been passed. All right, so the way that we specify default arguments in JavaScript is simply by putting an equals sign after the name of our argument here, right? So number of times, and then in this case, we're setting it equal to one, which basically means that if we don't pass that argument at all, or if we pass undefined explicitly, for that argument, what will happen is that this value here will be used for the value of number of times. So if we call our function again, just passing 10 as the first argument here, we'll see that that will give us 20, right? And therefore we only need to specify this last argument here if we really do wanna take advantage of the extra functionality, right? Doubling a number X number of times. And in that case, our function will work as well, right? If we run our code now after adding four, we'll, we'll see that this will give us 10 doubled four times. Now, one thing to note about these default values for function arguments is that they'll only kick in if the value of that argument is undefined. So as I said, if we pass undefined here explicitly as that argument, our function is still going to work as expected, right? This value is still gonna be one. We're gonna end up with the same result as if we had just passed 10 and not even specified an extra argument here. Now, on the other hand, this default value will not kick in if we pass null. And this can confuse a lot of people since uh, you know they just kind of get null and undefined mixed up in their heads. In that case, right, if null is the value that we pass, this default value is actually going to be overridden by null. All right, so if we run our code now, well, what you'll see is that we still get the answer 20, but, but that's only because of some of the technical details behind creating a new array, right? But if you log out number of times, right, if you log out the value of that here, what you'll see is that the value of that actually is null, all right? That's, it just so happens that calling new array with the value null gives us an array of length one. So who knows why that is? I was actually honestly surprised to see that, but whatever the case, null is going to replace the default value here. And, and the same is not true if we say undefined, right? If we say undefined and run this, we'll see that undefined here is replaced with the default value of one. All right, now before we go on, I just want to throw in a word about object destructuring when it comes to function arguments. First of all, object destructuring is when we wanna pass an object as an argument to the function instead of specific argument, right? So let's say that instead of our double function here, we wanna create a function called greet that takes a person as an argument and simply logs out person.name, right? And we'll say something like hi with the person's name. All right, well, in that case, if we call our function by saying greet, and we'll just pass a person with the name of Sean here. If we run our code now, what we'll see is that it says, hi, Sean. However, the problem here is that when we wanna access a lot of different properties on this object, right? For instance, if in addition to name, we also wanted to get age, hair color, likes, dislikes, weight, 
you know, all that kind of good stuff there, then we would have to go through and say person.name, person.age, person.hair color, person.weight, and so on and so forth, right? Which is a little bit inconvenient. So what developers often do in this case, and what JavaScript allows us to do, is use object destructuring to simply get each property from the object up here in the arguments, right? So instead of saying person.name, in the arguments, we could simply have our curly braces here and say name. And what this would do is it would basically get the name property from whatever object we pass in here and make that a local variable inside this function. So in this case, we would be able to say just name. And if we run our code again, we'll see that it still works just like before. Now, in this case, just like in the last case, there are going to be a lot of situations where you want to provide default values for these, right? For example, you know, if someone didn't specify their name, you might want to provide a backup value of n slash a, right? Well, in that case, if we were to now call this thing with just an empty object, which doesn't have a name property, of course, we would see that this would insert the default value there into this string. Okay, so in other words, providing default values when using object destructuring in an array follows pretty much the same syntax as providing default arguments for a function. But, uh, you know, obviously these things are now inside these curly braces and we're doing object destructuring. So anyway, those are the basics of default arguments in JavaScript. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've discussed default arguments in JavaScript functions, the last topic that we're going to cover here is what happens when we want to put functions inside objects, right? In other words, what happens when we want to have properties in our objects that are themselves callable functions? Well, first of all, I just want to point out that this is a perfectly valid thing to do in JavaScript. And it might look something like this, right? If we were to define a person object of some sort, and we could say something like name, uh, we'll just do my name here, Sean, we'll say age 100, we'll say hair color brown, and so on and so forth. We might want to have a simple function in here that does something like, uh, I don't know, prints out something to the console, right? So what that would look like, first of all, we would just say something like identify yourself. All right, we'll just call it that. And... All that this would be is a simple function that would log out something to the console like I am a person, okay? And in that case now, the way that we would actually call this function is simply by saying person dot identify yourself. All right, and you know, if you happen to be coming to JavaScript from Java or C++ or really any other object-oriented programming language, this is going to look an awful lot like calling a method on an object. And that's exactly what it is here as well, essentially. Basically in JavaScript, for reasons that we'll talk about in much more detail when we actually talk about uh, JavaScript's object-oriented inheritance scheme, so to speak. Basically in JavaScript, when you have a property of an object that's a function, this can be treated as if it were a method, right? So by saying person.identify yourself, what this is gonna do is simply call this function inside of here. And if we run our code here, we'll see that sure enough, it prints out, I am a person. Now this function admittedly isn't very interesting because it's not really very specific to this exact person, right? We're not printing out the person's name, we're not printing out the person's age or hair color, etc. If we want to do those things, this leads us to a special keyword in JavaScript and one that is the source of a lot of confusion, and that is the this keyword, right? So in JavaScript, when you refer to this, right, when you use the this keyword, essentially it can mean a lot of different things depending on the exact situation that you're in. And again, this is something that continuously confuses newcomers to JavaScript and even occasionally JavaScript veterans are confused by this. But in this exact situation, this is going to refer to the object that this function is a part of. Okay, so if we wanted to print out the person's name, right, 
we'll say something like this. We would say console.log, and we would say, hi, my name is, and then we would say this.name, right? And this.name would refer to the name property of the current object that this function is in. So now if we call person.identify yourself like that, and we run our code, well, what we're gonna see is, hi, my name is undefined. Now this brings us back to a very important distinction between arrow functions in JavaScript, which we're using right here, and functions defined using the function keyword in JavaScript. All right, and I mentioned this at the very beginning when we were reviewing the basic function syntaxes in JavaScript. This here is the main most important difference between arrow functions and the other functions defined with the function keyword is when we're using the this keyword. You see, when we're using the this keyword inside a function defined with the function keyword, right? If we were to change this function and say function blah, 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 like so, then what we'll see is that this will actually work, right? This dot name, in other words, will point to the right place. The problem, however, with arrow functions is that they don't bind correctly to the this variable. Now this can actually be somewhat useful in certain situations, right? There are certain situations where you want to use an arrow function specifically for this purpose to avoid binding this to, you know, a specific object and bind it somewhere else. But most of the time when you're working with functions as parts of objects, right? When you're working with methods, in other words, you're gonna want to use the function keyword. And as a matter of fact, there is a shortcut for this syntax here. Right, so that basically you don't have to write out the entire property name and the function keyword each and every time. And that syntax is simply like this, right? You can just say identify yourself or whatever you want that method to be called and put the parentheses right after it. And this is the equivalent of using the function keyword. All right, so what you'll see if we run this again is that everything still works, right? We still are pointing at the right property here when we say this.name. So anyway, that's how you add functions as properties to objects, right? And uh, this can be used in a number of different situations. And if you've ever worked with object-oriented programming before, I'm sure you're more than familiar with many of the things that methods can do in an object. One thing that they can do, of course, is they can allow us to modify different properties of an object, right? So if we wanted to do something like have a birthday, all right, we'll just make that a method here. And all that this will do is we'll say this.age plus equals one, right? So in other words, every time we call have a birthday on this person object, it will increment the value of the age property. All right, and we'll also put in a console.log here for good measure that says happy birthday to you. All right, so now if we call person.have a birthday, and here we'll print out the person's age at the top here as well. We'll say console.log age, or person.age rather. And then we'll say have a birthday, have a birthday, have a birthday. And then we'll log out their age at the end. Well, what we'll see now if we run our code is that I start off at 100 and after three birthdays, the age is now equal to 103. All right, and likewise, you can use these methods to retrieve the value of a given property, of course, or to combine different properties, right? A pretty common thing to do is want to actually print out all the details for a person. So you might want to define a method called uh, print details. And all that that would do is say something like console.log. Oops, and I forgot a comma there is why that red underline was going on. Uh, and then we could just say, name and print out the value of name by saying this.name. We could say age and print out the value of age by saying this.age. And then we could print out hair color by saying hair color this.hair color. All right. And now if we call print details, right? Just by saying person.print details like so. All we need to do now is run our code and what we'll see is that it prints out those details for that person, okay? And we can also have these functions return a value. If we just wanted to return this string instead of print it, we could say something like, we'd probably wanna call it get details or something like that. And then 
we could just say person.getDetails, and if we log that value out to the console, we would see that that would give us, oops, it looks like we got an error here. Oh, and that's just because I forgot to remove the uh, closing parentheses there. So let's try that again. If we run our code, we'll see that that will give us the same result. All right, so anyway, that's the basics of using functions inside objects, right? When you put a function inside an object, you're now able to use the this keyword to reference any of that object's properties. And uh, you can also call that function just like you would refer to any of the object's properties, but obviously you're gonna put parentheses after it as we've done here. And just one last thing that I wanted to show you here that I realized I promised you beforehand and never followed through on was I wanted to show you what happens if you try and use the arguments object inside an arrow function, right? We already saw that if you try and use the arrow function with the this keyword inside an object, right, as an object method, it won't work correctly. And similar things happen when you try and use arrow functions with things like the arguments object. All right, so let's define our function here. We'll say let sum, and then we'll just make it like this and use the arguments object inside of here. So normally, of course, we'd wanna say let total equals zero and then loop through the arguments and all that good stuff. But instead of doing that, let's just log out the value of arguments and you'll see that it's not going to be at all the same as what we saw with the function keyword, all right? So if we call sum now with one, two, three, four, just as an example, and run our code, what you'll see is that arguments here is not the arguments of the function, but it's actually the global arguments object, right? Which is something that we haven't talked about and it's not really important for our purposes here, but just know that it's not the correct arguments object as we saw if we were to use the function key. Right, so we could change this just by changing our arrow function to a function. And then if we run this, we would see that that would now work correctly. So anyway, that's just something to keep in mind is that arrow functions are a little bit different when you're dealing with external data, right? When you're dealing with things like scope and the this keyword and, and keywords like arguments that depend on scope. When you're dealing with those kinds of things, it's usually best to just stick to the function keyword functions in JavaScript. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. One of the things that makes the JavaScript language so versatile is the fact that it can be run in a very wide variety of different environments, right? So the main ones are, it can be run on the front end, and this is where everything started for JavaScript. It used to be a front end only language, and it can also now be run on the back end using Node.js. Now, when we write JavaScript programs for the back end, there's a different set of possibilities that are available to us, right? Now, one of those possibilities, which is what we're gonna be taking a look at here today, is the possibility of writing JavaScript programs that interact with the file system where that program is running, all right? Now, this isn't something that is available to front-end JavaScript, since obviously you can't allow programs that are running in a user's browser to access the files on their computer. That would just be a huge security flaw. So. What we're gonna be taking a look at here today is how to write Node.js programs in JavaScript, of course, for interacting with the file system. And this is all gonna be done using a special built-in package that is provided for us by Node.js called the FS package, right? And that's file system, of course. So without further ado, let's jump right in and see how to use the FS package in JavaScript to interact with the file system. All right, so let's start off here with the basics of working with files in Node.js. Uh, generally speaking, all file operations in Node.js are done via the FS package. And this is something that we've taken a look at very briefly in some of the other sections, but we're just gonna kind of start from scratch here to make sure that we're on the same page. So the FS package is something that's already built into Node.js, right? So you don't need to go installing it manually. It's already there, right? You can already import it into any Node.js file just by either saying let FS equals require FS or by doing the equivalent thing with import syntax, which would be import FS from FS, all right? So 
Uh, again, you can do these two things without ever having to actually install the FS package. You're never going to want to run npm install FS because, as I said, it's already included in Node.js to begin with. All right, so the FS package, basically what it allows us to do is interact with the file system of the computer that our program is running on, right? And if our program is running on a server, then we'll be interacting with the server's file system. And it allows us to do this in a way that's very similar to if we were to just run commands in the terminal, right? So, uh, you know, in other sections, we've already done similar things to this, where in our terminal, we might just want to do something like create a new directory, in which case we would just say make directory, and we could say my directory, and that will create that for us, right? If you list this out now, you can see that my directory is right there for us, and... If you wanted to remove that directory, you could do so just by saying rm my directory. Oops, and that should be rm dir, D-I-R, my directory. And that would remove that directory for us, right? We'll see that that's no longer there, right? And those are just a few commands. There's a lot of other operations that you might need to perform on the file system, right? Creating files, copying files, deleting files, modifying files. Uh, you know, moving entire directories around, reorganizing directories, etc. And in the terminal, of course, there are specific commands for doing each of those things. So essentially what the FS package allows us to do then is it allows us to do those same kinds of things from inside a Node.js script, right? So it allows us to do things like create new files from inside a Node.js script. It allows us to read the contents of files, right? So we can just read out regular files that already exist on our operating system. And of course, we can modify those files, right, by actually writing new content to them, deleting them, etc. All right, so the FS package allows us to do all these kinds of things on files, but it also allows us to operate on directories as well, right? So, you know, if we wanted to list out the contents of a directory, as you can do with the ls command on Linux machines, uh, you can do that same kind of thing using the FS package, as we'll see, right? So it allows us to do things like list directories, view their contents, and it also allows us to do things like change permissions, change ownership, etc. of resources, again, in the same way that you might be able to do that uh, just using the terminal, right? So change permissions, we'll say ownership, etc. Okay? Oops, here we go, ownership, there we go. And besides these things, it also allows us to do interesting things like watch files and directories, uh, you know, just to actually execute some code when they change, right? This is very useful in certain situations where maybe you want to automatically build all of your new code whenever one of your files changes. All right, so this FS package allows us to do all these kinds of things in the file system. And the long and short of it, again, is that it basically allows us to do inside our Node.js programs here, right, inside uh, JavaScript files, what we would normally be able to do inside the terminal. Okay, so that's the basic idea of the FS package. So let's actually take a look at the basics of working with the FS package, and then we'll get into actually seeing how all of the operations I just mentioned work. So... First things first, we're going to import the FS package. And again, you can do this in two ways, either using import or require. And which one of these you use is going to depend on your setup, right? If you already have a package.json file and it has this type module property in it, you'll probably want to use import. Otherwise, you'll want to use require. So just keep that in mind. Um, if you want to use import like I'm doing here, just go add that single line to your package.json and generate, of course, a package.json file if you don't already have one by running npm init-y. Okay, so anyway, importing the fs package is done just like this. We say import fs from fs, and then we'll start off by doing something pretty simple, and what we'll do is we'll just get some of these stats for a file in our directory here, right? So let's just do this for our package.json file. What we're going to do is we're going to say fs.stat, all right, I'll discuss what this uh, function does in more detail in just a minute here. We're going to say fs.stat, and then we're going to specify the path to our file. So we're going to say dot slash package dot json. And then as the second argument here, 
we're going to pass a callback function, which will take both an error as an argument, and the second argument here is going to be the actual stats of the file itself, okay? So, once we've done that, what we're gonna do is just print out the size of the file, which you can do by saying console.log, and then in backticks we'll say the file is, and then we'll say stats.size, and what stats.size is gonna give us in this case is the size in bytes of the file that we're opening, right? So this package.json file here. So we'll just say the file is stats.size bytes. Okay, so let's run this program now. We're gonna say node index.js and hit enter. And sure enough, we'll see that it prints out the file is 468 bytes. And if you wanna check that answer, you can always take a look in your file system at package.json, but that looks about right to me. So anyway, now that we've seen how to just get some basic information about a file in Node.js, let's circle back and take a closer look at some of the things that we just did here. So. The first thing that I want to point out is the way that we're going to be accessing most of the FS packages built in functions, right? We're going to say fs.stat or fs.read file or fs.write file or whatever, but for the most part, they're all going to have this same syntax where we say fs. Dot and then that function, right? So the FS package is basically just a big collection of different functions for performing different uh, tasks in the file system. All right, so the first argument here that we saw is the actual path to the file that we want whatever operation this is to be applied to, right? In this case, the stat function gets us the stats of a given file, and we'll take a look at a few more things that that allows us to see in just a minute. But that's the first argument there, is the file that we actually want to refer to. And this is something that we'll see also when we want to do something like read a file, write a file, etc. So anyway, the next thing that I want to point out here is this callback function. So most of the functions that we're going to see that the FS package contains are going to provide us with a series of different options with how we want to receive the results. Now, the thing that you should realize before I actually go through what these different options are is that reading and writing and, and really interacting whatsoever with the file system is inherently going to be an asynchronous operation in JavaScript. And what that means is that it's going to take quite a long time. It's gonna, it's gonna take a longer time than your program will usually be comfortable with. Even though to us, it's gonna seem like a pretty short time. Uh, you know, the, the actual amount of time involved in, in reading or writing a file, or even just something as simple as getting the stats for a file, is something that we have to handle asynchronously. So what this means is that generally we're not going to be able to just get the results of an fs function by, you know, declaring a variable and then saying equals, right? So we can't just say let stats equals fs.stat and then, you know, obviously pass the arguments here, right? What we have to do instead is we have to actually define a callback function, which as we've talked about in some other sections is basically just a function that gets called when this operation completes. Now, because this operation is gonna take a little while to complete in the first place, this function isn't gonna get called until several other things have happened. And I can illustrate this just by saying console.log and we'll just say here, right? If you run this program and you're not already used to working with callback functions, then what you would probably expect is for this console.log here to be called before this one. But as we'll see, if we run our code, here gets logged out before the actual size of the file, right? So that's the way that callback functions work in Node.js. Basically, the only place that we can be certain of having these stats is gonna be inside this callback function. That's why we said console.log, the file is stats.size bytes. Okay, so callback functions like this one are gonna be really the norm when working with FS package functions. And one more thing that I wanna point out here is, is this order of arguments that the callback function receives. All right, so you can see that the callback takes an error object as its first argument and the actual data that we're wanting in the first place as the second argument. Now, this is a pretty popular convention in Node.js whenever we're working with callbacks. In general, you're gonna see that these callbacks will take the error as the first argument, and if there's any data that you're actually waiting for, it's gonna take that as the second argument. Now, the error is really just any errors that occurred when trying to access the file, right? So 
um, if the file didn't even exist in the first place, right? If we were to try and access package123.json, and here we'll just log out error if it exists. We'll say if error, console.log error, and then we'll just say else so that the other thing doesn't get executed unless it succeeds. There we go. So if we run our program here, we'll see, sure enough, that an error gets logged out to the console saying that there's no such file or directory package123.json. So that's kind of what this error object is going to help us with. It's just going to tell us when something goes wrong with whatever operation it is that we're trying to perform. All right, so anyway, this is the most common thing that you'll see, right? This syntax with the callback passed as one of the arguments to the fs function. But there actually are two other ways to do this, all right? So, you know, I mentioned that there were three options available to us. This is the first option, and I'll just write it here. The first option is to use callbacks. And as I said, this is generally the most popular option. So the second option, though, is to use the so-called synchronous versions of the FS functions. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute. But basically, these synchronous versions are versions of the callback functions that we saw, but they execute synchronously. Now, what this means in JavaScript is that they're going to hold up the rest of the code from executing until that operation completes. So here, let me show you what I mean. If instead of doing this callback syntax that we had for fs.stat, we wanted to be able to do something more synchronous, right? Like saying let stats equals fs.stat. Well, in that case, we could tell the fs package that we want this to be synchronous instead of asynchronous with a callback by simply adding the suffix sync onto the end of the function name, right? So uh, instead of fs.stat, we have fs.stat. Sync. Now, this is going to do pretty much the same thing as what we saw down here, except it's going to do it, as I said, in a synchronous way. So if we say fs.statsync.slash/package.json, and here I'm just going to comment out this here, then what we can do now is we can actually log out the stats. So, you know, if we wanted to print out the file size, we could just say console.log, the file is stats.size bytes without having to worry about creating a callback function and putting this inside of it, right? So what's gonna happen if we run our program now is you'll see the file is 468 bytes and you'll see that the here log, right down here where we logged out the string here is actually executed after this console.log. Right, and that's because this code is synchronous, right? It goes line by line by line and waits for each line to execute before actually moving on, right? And I just wanna underline the fact that that can be a disadvantage because basically when you use a synchronous function like we're doing here, nothing else in our program can happen until that operation completes. Right, so this isn't a big deal when you're just creating a basic script that you're just going to be running on your own. But, you know, if you're creating a web server that has to respond to lots of different clients, you're never going to want to use these synchronous methods because basically what they'll do is just hold up your server while they wait to execute. And that can really impact the performance of your program. Right, so anyway, these synchronous methods are something that you're not really going to want to use very often. You're usually going to want to stick with using the asynchronous original version of all of these functions, right? Like fs.stat instead of fs.statsync. And that brings us to the third option that's available to us with these fs package functions, and that is to use promises instead of callbacks or synchronous versions. All right, so promises are something that we've talked about earlier. Basically, promises just give us a much nicer syntax to work with asynchronous code than callbacks, right? Because what can happen with callbacks is if you have several operations that all have to happen one after another and all of those operations are asynchronous, then what that's gonna end up looking like eventually, right? Let's say that we wanna read the stats of a file and then we want to read the file's contents. And you know, in that case, you'd have your file name there and you'd have another callback here, which would say error and then you'd have the actual file contents. And then inside here, let's say that you want to write some new content to the file. Well, you would do that by saying fs.writefile. And we're gonna talk about all of these other functions here shortly, so don't worry too much about them now. 
But the point here is that for each of these new operations, right, for reading the file, writing the file, etc., we're going to have to have a nested callback to make sure that these things happen in the right order, right? We saw that if you put something outside of the callback, there's no guaranteeing that that will be executed in the right order just, just because it's on a lower line in your program. So this can lead to something called callback hell, and this is something that I mentioned in a different section when we were talking about asynchronous code in JavaScript. Basically, callback hell is just when you have a large series of nested callbacks and you start to get this you know, continuous indentation thing going on. I've seen situations where you have, you know, a horizontal scroll bar at the bottom here just because you have so many nested callbacks. So that's generally something you'll want to avoid in your programs, and promises in JavaScript allow us to do that. So anyway, the FS package provides different versions of all of these functions, such as stat and read file, write file, all of the functions that we're going to learn about here. It provides versions of those functions that are promises. Now, the way that it does that is not by adding a promise suffix, right? You can't just say fs.stat promise and expect to be able to say, you know, dot then. What fs does instead is it puts all of these promise versions of their functions inside a sort of subsection of the fs package, right? right? And that subsection, so to speak, is fs promise. All right, so... Uh, that's how you import it. You say import and then in curly braces FS promise from FS. Oops, and that should actually be FS promises. And what this allows us to do here, just let me uh, comment that out. What this FS promises thing allows us to do is use all of the same functions like stat and all of the other functions we're going to talk about. But those functions are promises instead of callback functions. So, you know, if we wanted to get the stats, we could say FS promises dot uh, stat. And then we'll just say package.json, like so. And then instead of having a second argument that is the callback function, we can just say dot then, and that will give us the stats for our file, which we can print out just by saying console.log. We'll just use that same line here, like so. And if we run our file now, whoops, it looks like we got an error, and that is because... This is actually not called FS promises. It's just called promises. I don't know why FS promises occurred to me here, but if we just run that again, there you go. You'll see that you get the file is 468 bytes. Now, one thing that you'll usually see uh, with this promises thing, and this is perhaps where I got my FS promises typo there, is people will actually rename this just to FS so that they can just say FS.stat and have that automatically be a promise, right? So uh, basically by renaming this to FS, you just kind of take the emphasis off the fact that this is a special version of these functions. And a lot of people, myself included, just prefer to work with promises anyway. So uh, whenever I work with FS, I almost always uh, just say import promises as FS and then just use all of those functions as promises. Now, another implication of being able to work with all of these promise functions is that instead of having to say dot then dot then dot then, as you do with promises, you can actually switch over to the async await syntax. And the beauty of that is that it allows you to work with these asynchronous functions as using syntax that's very similar to these synchronous functions. Right, so if we wanted to use async await here with fs.stat promise, then we could just say let stats equals await fs.stat. And then, you know, we could just log out the stats after that. But of course, because of the way that async and await work, we would have to put this inside its own function. So we would say something like let run equals async. And then we could run our code here just by saying run. And this is just a little detail of async and await, so don't worry too much about any of this here if you're not already familiar with async and await. Just know that the main purpose here is to allow us to work with promises uh, using a syntax that looks more like synchronous code. So anyway, if we run our code again, sure enough, we'll see that we get the same result with our async await as we did with just our regular promises. So anyway, we've covered quite a bit in this video here. So let's just review some of the main points of the FS package. The first point is that it's built in, so you don't need to install it or anything into your projects. It's automatically included with Node.js. 
The second point is that it allows us to interact with the file system in a very similar way to what we're able to do in the terminal. Um, you know, it allows us to create files, work with directories, etc. right? So uh, it allows us to work with the file system, which is presumably where it gets its name, right? That's the FS package, which stands for file system. All right, the third thing that we saw is that there's really three main ways of working with all of these functions, right? We saw that we could work with uh, callbacks, we could work with the regular synchronous methods, or we could work with promises. So there's three main syntaxes, so to speak, of working with all of the FS package functions. So anyway, those are really the main things that you're going to want to keep in mind going forward. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've covered some of the basic things that you need to know to get started working with the FS package in Node.js, we're gonna move on and take a look at how to actually read file contents in a Node.js program. So to get started here, I'm actually gonna just delete all of this code that we wrote before for our demonstration purposes, and uh, that will give us a clean slate. Oh, and one last thing that I remembered shortly after recording the last video is that there's actually a shorter way to write this import promises as FS thing, if, of course, you actually want to use the FS promises and not just the regular FS package. And that is basically you just say import FS from FS slash promises. Okay, so that will basically assign the promises thing to a variable here called FS, and you can just do things like say let stats equals FS dot stat, and then you know, everything is going to be the same as what we saw before. Uh, keeping in mind, of course, that this fs.stat thing is going to be a promise, as will most of the other functions that you'll find on this fs thing here. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out. We are just going to be using the regular fs package for demonstration purposes, just because uh, that's the majority of what you'll see in examples online, etc. That's not to say that I recommend using the regular fs package in callbacks. I actually prefer personally to use the promises, but you know, just to get you used to all of these things, I'll, I'll start off by showing you the regular FS function and then I'll show you the promises version. So anyway, when we're talking about reading files using the FS package, the main function that you're gonna be using to read the contents of a file is a function called read file, okay? Now, just like with the fs.stat function that we saw before, read file has a sync version that you can use to synchronously read the contents of a file. So, you know, if you needed to, for some reason, read a file in synchronously and you didn't really care uh, about the performance, then you could just use read file sync and, you know, then you could just read in the contents of whatever file you want. But assuming, of course, that that's probably not what you'll want in many situations, you're going to want to use the regular read file function, whether that's on the promises or the callback version. So the read file function, basically, as I've already said, and as is probably obvious by the name, allows you to read in the contents of a file all at once. So let's just use our package.json file here as an example. What we're going to do is we're going to say fs.readfile package.json. And then, of course, for the callback here, we're gonna get an error as the first argument, all right, and that error is just going to be undefined if no error actually occurred, which is a detail that I don't think I mentioned uh, in the previous video. And then the second argument here is actually going to be the contents of the file. So, uh, you know, just assuming that we want to actually log out all of the contents of a file inside our script, all you would have to do is inside this callback, say console.log contents, and that would presumably log out all the contents of the file for you. So let's just try this out here. We're going to run our code. And what you're actually going to see here when we run this is something called a buffer. Now this is just the default for reading in files and you can actually get around this and convert it into an actual string just by passing another argument before the callback function here, which is gonna be utf dash Eight, right, so what we're saying here is, is that we want to read in the file as a UTF-8 string. So if we run our code again after adding that, 
what we'll see is that sure enough, it's, it's just going to print out all of the contents of our package.json file. All right, so if you wanted to do this with a simpler file, what you could always do is just create a new file in your folder. Here. And don't worry about all of these extra files here. If you don't have them, you don't need all of them. The main point here is that if we create a new file and call it something like hello.txt and just put something inside here, like hello from a file, then reading that in is as simple as just specifying the file path, right? So hello.txt. And then what we'll see is that the contents are just gonna be the string that we had inside the file. All right, now, as I already mentioned, the fs.read file function is going to read in the contents of the entire file at once. So, you know, if it's a multi-line file, like our package.json file was, and you have a need to actually parse the file line by line, then the way that you're gonna be doing that is by actually parsing the contents themselves and separating them by a new line character or something like that, instead of, you know, in certain languages like Java, where the main way that you read in file contents is just with a for loop, and, and then basically you would be able to loop through each line in a file and read that in, all right? So JavaScript with the read file function at least you have to read in the entire contents of a file at once and then worry about parsing those programmatically. There are other ways around this using something called streams, by the way, but that's actually a fairly complicated topic in Node.js, so that's something that we won't be looking at for a little while. But just know that it's there in case you ever have a need to parse very large files, right? If you're reading in gigabytes and gigabytes of text, that's probably not gonna work very well with your Node.js program. So. Anyway, just to give you an example of what that might look like, let's say that uh, instead of hello.txt, we have, um, let's say, a CSV file, all right? Let's say that we have a CSV file that contains person data, so we'll just call it people.csv, and just by CSV formatting, we would have the header, which would contain, uh, you know, the different properties that we would be specifying. So we'll say something like name, we'll do age, We'll do uh, hair color, just the normal property names there. And then underneath that, we would have a new line for each person whose data we wanted to specify in the CSV, right? So you could have Sean, you could have age 100, you could have hair color brown, you could have someone else here then. So let's say Bob, we'll say 56, uh, we'll say blonde, we could say Sue, we'll do 34, and we could say blue, right? Maybe Sue has blue hair. And then uh, we'll just do one more here. We'll do um, Jordan and we'll say uh, 50 and we'll say uh, maybe Jordan has black hair. Okay, so we have this very simple CSV file. And before we do this, I do want to point out that there are perfectly good libraries available for Node.js that implement all of the logic for you that you'll need to parse CSVs, but just for fun and to show you more or less how reading a file in like this would work and actually parsing it, uh, we're just gonna use this one and, and implement our own logic. So anyway, let's go back to index.js and let's change fs.read file here to read the new CSV file that we just created, all right? So we'll say fs.read file dot slash people dot CSV. And we're gonna leave the UTF-8 thing here so that we're actually reading in a UTF-8 encoded string and not a buffer. And then for the contents, what we're actually gonna do is split this into a number of lines. And we can actually do this using JavaScript's built-in split function that's available on strings. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say let lines equals contents dot split. And we're gonna split this by the new line character. So you're gonna to wanna to say backslash N, which is the invisible character that occurs every time a new line appears in a file, right? You can't see it there, but this backslash N thing is how you designate that in JavaScript. So what this is gonna do for us, if you log out uh, our lines variable here is it's actually going to take the raw contents and just split them into an array containing each line as an element. All right, so if we run this again, you'll see that sure enough, we have each of our lines as its own string and it's an element inside this array here. So now that we've done that, the next thing that we're gonna do is we're first gonna need to find out what headers are in the CSV, right? What properties the CSV actually contains. So the way that we're gonna do that is just by saying let property names 
equals, and then we're gonna say lines index zero. And then we're going to actually split this by the comma character, all right? So remember that uh, if we're gonna have this string here that's separated by commas and we wanna get each individual string in between the commas as its own element of an array, we can just call split and tell JavaScript what character we want to actually use as the split point for that string. So what this is gonna give us is the property names for um, all of the people in our people.csv file. So the last thing that we're gonna need to do now is loop through the remainder of the lines and create a new person object for each of those. So here's what this is gonna look like. We're gonna start off by getting all of the actual people data uh, besides the property names. So we're gonna get everything except for lines zero. And the way that we can do that is by saying let people lines equals lines dot slice. And we're gonna say that we want everything from index one and after. So we'll just say lines dot slice one. And now if we print out the property names and the people lines, well here, we'll just do people lines for now. So if we print that out, sure enough, we have all of our people. And if we print out the property names here, we'll see that we should have all of our property names. So now that we have all of that information separated, basically our strategy with this is going to be to loop through each of these person lines, and then we'll probably have you know a nested loop of some sort where we loop through each of the property names, and we're basically going to pull out each individual item here and assign that string as the value for whatever we're reading in. So what that's gonna look like now is we're going to loop through all of our people lines. So here, let's first start off by just saying let people, and this will be an empty array. And now we're going to loop through each of our people lines. So we'll say for let line in, or of rather, let line of people lines. And then we're gonna say let property values equals, and we're going to actually split that line by a comma, very similarly to what we did up here with our property names. So we'll say let property values equals line dot split on the comma character. And now what this is gonna be is an array containing all of the values, right? So for the first line here, that would be an array with the string Sean, the string 100, and the string Brown. So all we have to do now is sort of pair that up with these property names here. And what that's gonna look like is we're going to loop through all of the property names. So we'll have a little nested loop in here by saying for let property name of property names. Okay, and for each property name, what we're gonna do is we're going to add a new property onto an object. So first, let's actually create a new object. We're gonna say let person, and it's just gonna start off as an empty object. And then inside here, we're gonna say person property name equals, and then we're gonna have to get the corresponding property value for that. Now, in order for that to work, we're gonna need to get the actual index that we're on in this property names array. So if you remember, all you need to do to do that in JavaScript, it's kind of a weird way actually, is say dot entries on the array itself, and then you need to wrap property name in square brackets and say index and property name. Okay, so now all we need to do is say property values, oops, there we go, property values, index, and that should give us the correct corresponding property value for each property name. All right, so once we've done that, we're just gonna push that person onto our people array. So let's just say people dot push person. And that's pretty much all we need to do. So if we log out the result now, we're gonna say console.log people, we should see that this will have successfully parsed the CSV file. All right, so let's open this and we're gonna run it. And sure enough, we see that we have JavaScript objects that are the representation of all of the data that we had in our CSV file. All right, now all of this would apply just the same way if we were to use the FS promises instead of just the regular FS package. In that case, the only thing that would be different is that you would either have this callback in a dot then function instead of just uh, as the third argument to fs.read file, or if you were using async await, you would actually just use await to get the result here, right? So you could say let contents 
equals await fs.read file, and the rest of the logic would be the same as what we had here. All right, so anyway, that is how to read the contents of basic files in JavaScript. And we also took an in-depth look at how you would actually go about parsing file contents if you needed to do that. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so now that we've seen how to read files using the FS package in Node.js, the next thing that we're gonna take a look at is how to write files. Now, do you wanna take a wild guess at what the function name is for writing files in FS? That's right, it is fs.write file. All right, so this write file function is gonna be the function that you'll generally wanna use when writing data to a file. Now, there is another function that we'll talk about as well, and that is fs.append file. And uh, the difference between these two is something that we'll talk about in just a minute here. But these are generally the two functions that you'll use whenever you want to take some kind of content or some kind of uh, string that you have in your code and write it to a file. Now, just like with fs.read file, each of these write file and append file also has a sync version. So if you wanna do write file sync, that is also a function. You would just work with that synchronously instead of using a callback or a promise like we saw. And append file also has a sync version. Um, and as I said, really the vast majority of FS functions that you'll use have that sync suffix that you can add on that will basically just give you a synchronous version of that function. So anyway, let's uh, just, I'm just gonna comment out this fs.read file stuff here. Let's just take a look and see what this fs.write file function is like to work with, and then we'll take a look at append file as well. So let's just say, for starters, that we wanna just take a simple JavaScript string and write it to a new file. All right, so let's just say fs.write file is gonna be just like we've seen with our other functions. It's just gonna be the path to the file. Now, this doesn't actually have to be a file that already exists, right? This could be, you know, new file.txt if we wanted to call the file that. And what JavaScript is actually gonna do here is it's going to create a new file in its place, all right? So if the file doesn't already exist, JavaScript will just create that new file for us and write whatever data we want to it. Now, if the file does already exist, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But let's just say that we wanna write a simple string to this file. All we would have to do is specify that string here. We'll say, hello file. And the last function that we'll have to pass to fs.write file is a callback. Now this callback, unlike with some of the other callbacks that we've seen before, ones that have had some extra data here, this callback is really only gonna have a single argument and that's gonna be any errors that occurred. So, you know, if an error occurred, we would obviously wanna print that out and handle it somehow, but for now we'll just say console.log error. And there's not really anything else that we need to do, right? Writing to a file is a pretty simple uh, operation, right? There's not really any return value that we would be interested in in this case. So anyway, that's the basics of writing to a file. Let's run our code now. We're just gonna say node index.js and nothing is gonna happen here. If you wanted to make this a little bit more developer friendly, you could always just say uh, console.log finished. Uh, here, let's go back to here, finished writing to file. Okay, because for some people it can be a little off-putting when you just run code and nothing happens. Uh, but what you'll see is that there is actually a new file here called new file txt, and inside here you see that it says hello file, right? That's the data that we just wrote to that file. So anyway, that's how to write basic data to a file. And while we've written just a basic JavaScript string to this file, it is possible to write other types of data as well. So, you know, if you wanted to write just a basic JavaScript object here, we'll just say B2C3, all right? Now, if we run our code again, what you're actually gonna see is that that gives us an error. And that's because in order to write something to a file, you have to at least convert it to a string. So by calling json.stringify on this, 
which uh, is JavaScript's built-in function for converting some kind of internal JavaScript data into a string, right? So you can convert arrays, objects, etc., into a string. If we change that now and run our code again, what you'll see is that it says finished writing to file. And if you go back and take a look at newfile.txt, it will contain our stringified JavaScript object inside of here. Now, one thing to notice, and this brings up an important difference between our write file and append file functions that we talked about, is that fs.write file will automatically overwrite whatever contents that file already contains if the file exists, right? So, you know, if the file doesn't already exist, then that's fine. It will just create a new file and, and put whatever data we want inside of it. But if the file already exists and already has content, it will actually overwrite that content. All right, so if you don't want that to happen, and in most cases you won't, then you're gonna wanna use the append file function instead. So let's just uh, switch out write file here with append file and watch what happens. If we say fs.append file new file.txt and insert the same data, if we run our code, what we're gonna see is that it says finished writing to file. And sure enough, in new file.txt, the original data has not been overwritten and we've ended up appending this new data to our file. All right. So anyway, that's the difference between fs.write file and fs.append file. In most cases, you are going to want to use append file, as I said, because, um, you know, I can't think of too many situations where it's okay to just overwrite the contents of a file without really even checking to see what they are. The only thing that really comes to mind initially would just be, you know, if you're actually building some JavaScript code and you want to get rid of the old build, all right? That would be maybe a situation where you'd use write file because you just want to overwrite whatever is there because it doesn't matter. But anyway, in this case, you probably would want to use append file. And those are really the two functions for writing code to a file in Node.js. Um, so just to close out here and just to get a little bit more experience with working with append file and uh, also with write file, let's do the reverse of what we did with fs.read file, where, where we read in data from a CSV file and converted it to a JavaScript object. And let's write some code that takes some JavaScript objects and writes them into a CSV file, all right? So basically what that code would do is it would just add extra people to our people.csv file. Okay, so with that example in mind, let's actually just uh, remove our code here. And what we're gonna wanna do first is just specify some simple data. We'll just say something like let new person equals, and then we'll just have this be a simple JavaScript object. So we'll say name, and this person's name will be, I don't know, let's say Bill. And then we'll say age and we'll say 44 and then we'll say hair color. There we go. And we'll just do, I don't know, green. All right, Bill maybe has green hair. Okay, so now that we've done that, then the next thing that we're gonna need to do is, well, two things really. One is we're gonna have to take this data and convert it into CSV format. And two is we're gonna want to then write that to a file. So to get started with that, all we're really gonna need to do is use object.keys and object.values to separate the keys and values. So what that'll look like is we'll say let header row, all right? This is gonna be the first line in the CSV. So let's maybe just say header line. And then this is just gonna be name, age, and hair color all separated by commas. So to get that, we just need to say object.keys new person and then we'll say dot join and we're going to join them together with a comma character all right so this is going to give us the exact format that we have inside people.csv okay so now that we have that the next thing that we're going to do is get the actual person data line so we'll say let person line equals and for that we're just going to say object dot values new person and then we're gonna say dot join with a comma as well. So it's gonna be pretty much the same strategy with that as with the header line. So now that we have those two things, we're just going to join both of those strings together with a new line in between them, right? That new line is important for actually putting the new data on another line, right? There's a new line after each one of these, even though you can't see it. So all we're gonna to need to do is say let data equals header line plus, and then we're gonna add that 
backslash n character in between these two things. And then we're gonna say plus person line, okay? And that's it. Now that we have that, we can just write this data to a new file. We'll just say something like people2.csv. And then we're just gonna replace json.stringify here with our data. So we'll just say data. And then of course we would wanna say something like uh, console.log finished writing data to file. Okay, so let's run this and see what happens. We're just gonna run node index.js. We should see finished writing data to file. And now if we open up this people2.csv file that was just created here, we should see sure enough that we have name, age, hair color, and bill 44 and green in there. All right, now in the case that you wanted to append a person to an existing CSV file, basically all you would wanna do there is ignore the header line and just create a new person line and use fs.append file to add that person to whatever CSV document was already there. So anyway, that's the basics of writing data to files in Node.js using both the append file function, which does not overwrite content in an existing file and the write file function, which does. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. So far, whenever we've run our JavaScript programs using Node.js, we've used the same command, right? And that is node followed by the file name that we wanna run. So node index.js, for example. Now, this is obviously the correct way to run uh, JavaScript programs in the node runtime, but so far we've left out a key tool that can be used to make your node scripts much more flexible, and that's something called command line arguments. Now, basically, command line arguments are to Node.js programs what arguments are to regular JavaScript functions, right? They allow us to pass in data to our JavaScript programs without actually specifying that data and hard coding it in the programs themselves. So this allows us uh, a lot more flexibility when running our programs since we can you know, run the same program with different data without having to change that program at all. And this is gonna be very helpful for us as we'll see. So that's what we're gonna be taking a look at here today. Without further ado, let's jump right in. All right, so to get started here, the first thing that we're gonna take a look at is how to get input from users by using command line arguments. Now, now this is just one of several different ways that we can get input from users in our command line applications, but it's usually gonna be your first choice for you know user input that's going to apply to the whole run of that program. Okay, now first of all, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, command line arguments are just extra arguments that we can pass when we run our program. So as we've seen, the way that you run a program in Node.js is by using the node command and then the name of the file, right? So in our case, that's been something like index.js. And in this case, the file name here, index.js, is a command line argument, right? You can think of this as sort of an argument to this node command that we're running. And you know, you can probably imagine that if we were going to write this in actual JavaScript code, it would just look something like this, right? You'd have node and then index.js is a string. Now, obviously this won't work, but this is kind of the idea here. Now, there are a lot of different use cases for these command line arguments, but usually it's when you wanna make your programs a little more generic, right? You wanna write a JavaScript program that can be used to do many things, such as the node command, for example, which can run pretty much any file, depending on what file name we pass after this. And, you know, basically it allows us to do to our node programs what functions allow us to do to our JavaScript code, right? They allow us to take some very specific code that we write in you know, our index.js program, let's say, and make it a little bit more generic so that by passing in different arguments, right? And just an example of this might be if we were to say node index.js, and let's say that we wanted to write a greeting program, right? A, a program that just says hello with someone's name, right? Well, what we would wanna do is make it so that we could pass someone's name after this, and the name would then be incorporated into that run of the program, right? 
So that's how command line arguments work, and there are a few main varieties of command line arguments. The first kind is the kind of argument where you just pass some kind of value after whatever command it is that you're running, right? So if you say node index.js and then pass the name Sean after that, that's just a regular command line argument. Now the alternative would be to use something called flags, and you've almost certainly seen this before. Um, flags are basically used in commands such as npm init dash y, and they usually have either one or two dashes before them, depending on you know the conventions of the program or script that you're running, right? So in the case of the npm init command, what this dash y flag, and this is called a flag by the way, what this dash y flag did is it just told this command, okay, we just want to accept all of the defaults. We don't want to walk through each and every question. Whereas if we were to leave that off, right, as we saw, then NPM would actually ask us some questions and we would have to go through and answer each of those. So anyway, flags are another kind of command line argument that can allow us to change the, uh, change the functioning of our programs without having to actually change the code of the programs, right? We're just changing the arguments that we're passing in when we run the command. Now on that same note, you can also have flags that take a specific value, right? So uh, again, let's say that we were writing a greeting program and instead of just having the name be the argument that comes after node index.js, we wanted to actually label what this string here, what this value was used for. Well, in that case, what we could do is we could use a flag that would label this as the name. And in order to do that, we would just say dash dash or just dash or whatever, again, depending on the convention of whatever program you're using. And then you could just say name Sean, right? And in a lot of cases, uh, programs will actually provide a shorthand version of the flag. So you might be able to just say dash N Sean. And you've probably seen this if you've worked with something like GitHub where, you know, if you want to commit your code, you say git commit dash M. And what this dash M flag does is it specifies the commit message that will go along with the code changes that you just made, right? So you might say something like refactored some functions, okay? And this here would be the value for this command line argument. So anyway, the point here is that there are several different options that are available to us when getting input from users via command line arguments. So the next thing that we're going to take a look at here is how to actually get command line arguments. Well, command line arguments in Node.js can be accessed in a fairly straightforward way, and that is simply by referring to process.argv. All right, process.argv, what this is, it's, it's just a global, so you don't have to import it or anything, although uh, there are some changes coming to more recent versions of Node.js, such as Node.js 18, where um, apparently you're gonna actually start importing this process thing. But for now, we'll just ignore that detail. So this process.argv thing is going to basically contain all of the arguments that were specified when the user ran this program. So first and foremost, the easiest way to see this would just be to write a very simple JavaScript program. We'll say something like console.log and we'll print out process.argv. Okay. So if we run this program now, what we're going to do is we're going to say node index.js and then let's just pass some other arguments after this. So we'll say Sean, we'll say one, two, three, and um, I think that's good enough. So let's hit enter. And what you're going to see is that this process.argv thing is an array and it contains the values that we just passed in after the node.index.js thing, as well as these two segments themselves, right? So you can see that node gets interpreted as the node script, which as you can see here, this is just the uh, path to my local installation of node. And the second thing here is the full path to the file that we're running. So you can see that there's a little bit of interpretation that goes on here before we actually get to this console.log line uh, with process.argv. Okay, now the thing that we're concerned about here is these last segments where we said Sean, one, two, three, and you know, you could really specify anything else as well. So if you wanted to add some flags, such as, you know, name, and then we'll say something like uh, numbers, okay? 
Well, you'll see that those are just going to be interpreted as individual arguments or segments as well, right? So as you can see, Node doesn't really offer too much help in interpreting these things here. That's actually something that, for the most part, we're going to have to do ourselves inside our program. And there are also, of course, some NPM packages that can help us out with this um, if you really don't want to do the work yourself. But I highly recommend working with this yourself just to get an idea of some of the things that are possible with these flags. So anyway, now that we know what these arguments look like when we run some kind of command with them, we can actually start to come up with a strategy for working with these arguments. So the first thing to notice is that almost always we're going to want to drop the first two arguments, right? These two, um, there are very few situations where you're actually going to need those two arguments. So what we'll usually end up doing is using the slice command to get all of the other arguments besides those first two. Okay, so if we say process.argv.slice, and what we're going to want to do is call this with the argument 2, which will basically tell JavaScript to start at index 2, which is this one here, and go all the way to the end, right? So this will give us all of the arguments that we're actually interested in. So now that we've got those, and what you'll usually see is developers will do something like let argv or args or whatever equals process.argv.slice. And this allows us, as I said, to actually work with those arguments. Now that we have the arguments, let's actually take a look at how to do something with these arguments, okay? So the first thing that we're going to do is, I suppose, let's just write a program that will add some numbers together for us, right? Not the most exciting program in the world, but it'll give us a good idea of how these programs usually work. So what we'll do is we'll just say node index.js, and let's just try 10 and 11 for now, I suppose. And what we'll see if we print out this args again, let's just say console.log args and try that again, is we're left with the array with 10 and 11 inside of it. Now, one thing that you'll notice here, you probably have noticed this by now, is that all of the command line arguments that we get in Node.js are by default going to be strings. So in other words, if we want these to be numbers, we're going to need to know that ahead of time and actually manually convert those into numbers because, you know, as we can see here, they're strings. So if we wanted to add these together, it would end up with 1011 because that's how adding these two strings together would work. All right, so we want to avoid that, obviously. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off here by converting our arguments to numbers, okay? So we'll say let numbers equals, and then we'll just do args.map. And what we'll do is, ju is just map each argument, and we'll just say arg for this, I suppose, to a number by saying number arg. All right, so that's the way that you convert a number string in JavaScript to an actual number. Okay, so now that we have the numbers, let's print those out to make sure that we're on the right track here. And if we run this again, sure enough, we'll see that we have the numbers 10 and 11. So all we have to do is add those together. And uh, uh, in order to do that, we'll just say in backticks, the sum is, and then we'll just add together numbers index zero. And we'll say plus numbers index one. And that should be it. So let's try running this one more time. And sure enough, we'll see the sum is 21. Now again, you can try this out by changing these numbers. So if you wanted to try adding together, I don't know, 123 and 234, then you would see the sum is 357. Okay, so before we move on, let's just uh, take this one step further and allow ourselves to pass in any number of arguments, and then we'll just calculate the sum of all of those numbers. So in other words, instead of just passing in two numbers, we'll be able to pass in three or four or 10 or however many we want. So what this is going to look like is instead of just referring to numbers 0 and numbers index 1, we're going to actually get the sum of all of our numbers here. And there are a few different ways to do that. So I'm going to use JavaScript's built-in reduce function. So we'll say let sum equals numbers.reduce. And all we're going to have to do here is say sum and x sum plus x. And if you don't understand what's going on here, there is another section where we talk about the reduce function in more detail, but all you really need to know for this is that this is getting the sum of all of our numbers, all right? So pretty straightforward. 
Oh, and one last thing we want to do here is add the default value or the starting value for reduce, which will be zero. So in other words, if uh, someone runs this program with no arguments, then it will just return zero as the sum. So now all we have to do is say the sum is and add the sum there. And if we run this again, we'll see that it says the sum is 357. And uh, let's try this with more numbers, I suppose. So one, two, three, two, three, four, we'll do three, four, five. And if we hit enter, we'll see that that gives us the sum of those. Uh, if we just run node index.js without any arguments, we'll see that that gives us zero. And if we run it with, let's say one argument, so that'll give us the sum of that one number as well. Okay, so the main idea here with working with command line arguments, as I said before, is that it really allows us to make our programs more flexible. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to test our programs with different values without actually having to make changes to the programs themselves. So, you know, in the past, whenever we've wanted to test some kind of program with different values, right? Let's say that we wanted to uh, create an add function, just as an example, and I'm just gonna comment all of this stuff out for a minute. Let's say that we wanted to write an add function that took three numbers, X, Y, and Z, and just returned the sum of those. Well, if we wanted to test out this function, then what we've had to do so far is we've had to actually say console.log add and then actually specify some hard-coded numbers. And if we want to test some different scenarios, we either have to go back in and actually change this statement here or just write multiple lines, right? So, all right, so if we wanted to test this thing with different numbers, we would have to actually add multiple console.log statements in order to make sure that this function works the way that we want it to. And obviously this function is gonna do what we want it to do because it's such a simple function, but you know, this is just sort of a proxy for more complex functions that we might wanna test out. So again, if we wanted to test this, we would have to actually run this and see, okay, cool, yep, that matches what we wrote here, that matches what we wrote here. And you know, that's a little bit tedious to do if you then have to go in and test, okay, what happens if we pass all zeros, right? And then you have to try running that again and you see, okay, it looks like that one works and then you have to go back and change the code and try it again and again and again. So with command line arguments, what we're able to do is we're able to test functions like this just by passing in different data via the command line. So if we wanted to test this thing out in a different way, right? If we wanted to test our function out here, then all we would have to do is get the arguments and we would have our numbers. And then we could just say for our test script, we would see console.log and we could say something like the result of calling add with, and then we could even print out our numbers here by saying args index zero, args index one, Okay, so we're just hard coding it here and, and specifying three exact arguments. And then we would say args index two, and here let's add and here. And then we would just say the result of calling the add function with those arguments is, and then we could just actually call add with args index zero, args index one, and args index two. All right, now at first glance, this probably looks like a little bit of a hassle to test out a function uh, by using command line arguments because we have to get the arguments up here, we have to uh, specify what each argument is, etc. But in reality, the time that we end up saving by not having to go back in, change our code, rerun it, go back in, change our code, rerun it, is usually well worth it. And by the way, you can make this even easier by just saying let, and then using array destructuring to say x, y, and z equals args, or uh, numbers rather we would want. Sorry, I uh, forgot about the numbers thing here. These should all be numbers index zero, numbers index one, etc. cetera. Uh, and then you could just say X and Y, there we go. And you could change this one to Z. And then you could just call this with add X, Y, and Z. All right, so that makes it a lot shorter to write out in case that was bothering you. So let's try this again. And if we wanna test our add function now, we can just say node index.js and we can pass in one, two, and three, for example. And we'll see the result of calling add with one, two, and three is six. And you know, if we wanted to try this with different numbers, let's say, uh, I don't know, zero, 23, and 
188, we see that this allows us to try our add function with different numbers without having to make any changes to our codes. So anyway, command line arguments, as we saw, can be a very nice way to allow ourselves to test our code with a lot of different types of data without having to actually go through that annoying cycle of changing our code and rerunning it. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've seen how to deal with basic command line arguments in a Node.js program, the next thing that we're gonna take a look at is how to correctly parse flags and flag arguments in Node.js. All right, so as we already saw, the idea of flags is allow us to either specify some kind of Boolean value as we run our program, right? As in the case of npm init-y, this here doesn't really have any value beyond just specifying that yes, we want to skip all of the questions, right? We're not saying uh, dash y and then passing some kind of value after that. Okay, so that's the simplest case of flags because really we can just treat that as a simple Boolean value, right? All we're doing is checking to see if that's in the arguments or if it's not. Okay, so we'll see how to do that in just a minute. But keep in mind too that we're gonna need to be able to deal with uh, command line arguments that are passed as a value after a flag, right? So uh, again, we might wanna say node index.js and if we wanna specify someone's name, then we could say dash dash name, Sean, for example. All right, now the tricky part about working with flag arguments in Node.js and really any command line application is that by design, they're not meant to have to go in a specific order, right? So in other words, if our program takes in a name and an age, right? By saying dash dash name, Sean, dash dash age 100, then what we're saying here really with these flags is that we wanna be able to pass this in in really any order we want, right? So we could also pass this in in the opposite order by saying dash dash age 100 and dash dash name Sean, and we would want the program to work the same way, right? And the same thing goes for Boolean arguments as well. If we were to have arguments like dash A, dash B, dash C, dash D, that all represented some kind of uh, Boolean value in our program, right? Turning certain pieces of functionality on or off or whatever, we would wanna be able to pass those in in different orders too, right? Just out of convenience. So this makes things a little bit trickier because we can't just expect a flag to be at a specific position in our arguments like we could when we were just passing positional arguments, all right? So this is going to require a slightly different approach than what we were able to do when we were just passing some simple number arguments like one, two, three into our program, right? So just as an exercise here and to get a little bit more familiar with uh, parsing command line arguments and uh, just some of the possibilities that go along with it. Let's take a look at a quick example of how to do this. And maybe at some point we'll figure out a handy function that will take care of all of this for us, right? Just from the code that we'll write here. So again, let's say that instead of having just our positional number arguments here, one, two, three, let's say that we want to get the person's name and say hello to that person and we also want to pass the numbers in, and we wanna specify both pieces of information using flags, right? So we wanna say something like name, Sean, and then we wanna say dash dash numbers and pass in several numbers, right? All right, and this is another thing that can potentially further complicate working with flag arguments is the fact that certain flags might take multiple values, right? So you might have one, two, and three as the values for this flag here. So anyway, let's start off with the name because that's the easiest one to parse. What we're gonna have to look for here is whether or not this name flag is included in the arguments in the first place, right? And you know, in certain situations, the name flag might be required. So if it's missing, we might wanna print something out like needs to have the name flag something like that, just letting the user know that they forgot a flag, right? Or, you know, there might be situations where that flag isn't required and therefore we don't really care if it's there or not. But either way, we're gonna wanna look for it just to see if the value is there. And in order to do that, 
what we're gonna wanna do is use one of JavaScript's built-in array functions, probably the function index of, all right? So what we're gonna do, and you'll see how the index of thing works in just a minute here, but what you're gonna wanna do is say, let name flag index equals, and then we'll say args dot index of, and we're actually gonna ignore this numbers thing here for a minute, and we'll just comment out these two things here. All right, so we're gonna say name flag index equals args dot index of, and all we're gonna do here is search for the name flag. All right, so we're gonna say dash dash name, and just to make sure we're on the right track here, let's log this out, and we'll say console.log, name flag index. And what we'll expect to see here is that that will return zero because we get rid of these two arguments and we end up with an array with the rest of our arguments. So the name flag in this case should be at index zero and we'll try it um, in some other positions in just a minute here, but let's hit enter. And sure enough, we get zero. Okay, so let's try moving this now. We'll just add some other stuff in front of it. We'll say, I don't know, one, two, three in front of it. And sure enough, we'll see that the name flag index adapts along with where we put it. So, all right, so now that we have the index of this name flag, we know in an ideal world, assuming that the user has actually passed in a value after the name flag and knows how to use the name flag, we can assume for now that the value that comes after that in the arguments is going to be the value for that name. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say, let name equals args, and then for the index, we'll say name flag index plus one. And now we should be able to print out the name. So we'll say console.log, and in back ticks here, we'll say the name is, and then we'll print out the name. Okay, so let's run this again, and what we should see is the name is Sean, and let's try this again. Uh, we'll just change the position of that here. We should see the same result and so on and so forth. All right, so it looks like everything's working pretty well so far with our name flag. So the next thing that we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna wanna be able to handle the case where the name flag isn't there, right? So maybe the user forgot it or maybe they intentionally left it off. But in either case, we're gonna want to make sure that we uh, do the right thing. So what we're gonna look at first is the case where we want this name flag to be required. So what we'll do in that case is say if name flag index is less than zero. And you may remember that this index of function, if uh, this element isn't actually found in the array, will return negative one, right? So that's why we're checking to see if the name flag index is less than zero so that we can print out some kind of error. Okay, so what we would do in that situation, we would say if name flag index is less than zero, then we'd want to print out some kind of error, and this can be done by saying console.error. Okay, that will just change the way that it's displayed in the console. And uh, what we could do is we could say something like the name flag with a value is required. Okay. And in that case, we would want to stop the script early, right? If there's an error like this, we usually want to stop. And we could either do that by saying throw new error, which would uh, create a new error in our program, or we could just say process.exit with the status code one, meaning that there was an error, right? This is just how we shut down a Node.js program with an error when you know the person didn't run the code correctly. Okay, so let's try this again. And what we're gonna do this time is we're going to run node index.js without the name flag. So we'll add maybe a numbers flag, one, two, three, and hit enter. And what we'll see is that it says the name flag with a value is required, okay? So that's more or less how we handle this kind of thing. If we wanted to make sure that there was a value specified for a flag, we would pretty much have to do the same kind of thing. Right? So we could check and make sure that name is an actual value and not a flag by saying if name dot starts with, which is just a built-in JavaScript function for telling whether or not a string starts with a certain string. And then we could say dash dash. And we would probably also wanna check and make sure that the name exists, right? So we would say if the name doesn't exist or if the name starts with the double dash, right? So if the user didn't specify a name or if uh, the thing that comes after it is a flag, then what we would wanna do is the same thing that we did up here. We would want to um, just print out some kind of error. So in this case, we could say console.error and we could say 
the name flag requires a value or something like that. Okay, and then we would wanna exit again. Now the reason, by the way, that you're seeing name crossed out in my IDE is just because name is a global in some situations, so my IDE, for some reason, is just interpreting it incorrectly. So just ignore that. It's kind of annoying that it does that. But anyway, now if we try and run this and just pass the name flag, right, we'll see the name flag requires a value, and you know if we pass a flag after that and say numbers one, two, three, right? So in other words, if we specify the name flag and then forget to add a value and then just add another flag with some values after it, we'll see the name flag requires a value, just the same as we saw before. So as you can imagine, all of this code that we wrote here can potentially get pretty repetitive if you know you have multiple flag arguments that you want in your program, right? If you have name and then you have numbers and then you have, um, I don't know, first name, last name, etc., it can get a little bit repetitive to write out the if statements, checking pretty much the same things and printing out pretty much the same things. So what we can do in situations like this is actually create a function to help us parse certain flag values, all right? So uh, let's just create this right now. What, what we'll do is we'll say function and we'll call this function something like parse flag. And what this function will do is it will take a flag name and it will take the arguments and it's simply going to search for the value for that flag name in the arguments, all right? So really all we're gonna have to do is copy the code that we wrote from before and we'll paste it into there and just have it return the value that it gets for this flag name, all right? So what we'll do is we'll just say args.index of flag name and we'll probably also wanna change the variable name so we'll say flag index and just call it that then we'll change that here as well. So if the flag isn't in there, then what we're gonna to wanna to do is log out an error. So we'll just say console.error and we'll change this to backticks so that we can insert the name of the flag here. So we'll say uh, flag name and then we'll do the same thing down here. So we'll say flag index plus one and this will be the value, right? We'll change the name of that variable to value and then we'll wanna do value and value dot starts with, and then we'll do the same thing here and change this to a backtick string so that we can insert the name of that flag into the string. So we'll say flag name, and that should be it. The last thing we're gonna wanna do is just return the value here. So we'll say return value. So now all we need to do to parse our name flag is just say let name equals parse flag and we'll say dash dash name, okay? And then we can just print it out, all right? So you can see now that if we wanna get other arguments, this makes it a lot easier. So if we wanted to say let age equals parse flag uh, dash dash age, it's gonna be pretty simple to do that, right? We don't have to rewrite any of this code. We can simply use this parse flag function to take care of all of that for us. So I'm gonna get rid of that for now just because we're only interested in looking at the name. And let's run this thing so that we can test it. All right, so we'll say node index.js name, and we'll say Sean. And oops, it looks like we forgot to pass the arguments to our parse flag function. So we'll say parse flag, and we want our args passed to it like so. So let's try that one more time. And sure enough, we'll see the name is Sean. And we should see that this persists even if we add some other things in front of it, right? So if we add some other flags like so, we'll still see that the name is Sean is found. Now, if we don't specify a value for this flag, we should see that our program says the name flag requires a value and it will exit. And, you know, if we just uh, don't include the flag at all, we'll say the name flag with a value is required. Okay, so this has just been an introductory look at how to work with basic flag arguments in Node.js. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've seen how to parse basic values from command line flags in Node.js, the next thing that we're gonna take a look at is how to parse flags that either have no value at all, right? So Boolean flags, and also how to parse flags that take multiple values, such as our numbers flag that we've been talking about, right? That takes the numbers that we wanted to add together in our application in the first place. 
All right, so both of these are going to require a slightly different approach. So let's start off with the Boolean flags first, since those are going to be probably the easiest ones to figure out. Okay, so first of all, while I've been writing out the Boolean flags with just one dash, that's usually the short form of the flag itself, right? So, you know, for npm init dash y, that's just the short form for dash dash yes, right? And that's going to give us the exact same thing in that case if we run it as if we had just said dash y. All right, now adding short forms of flags is another thing that we're going to do here. But before we do that, let's just take a look at how to work with flags that are just supposed to be Booleans, assuming that they have the same uh, structure and syntax as our other flags, right? They start with a double dash, and then they have some kind of string that comes after that. Okay, so what we're going to want to do here probably is create another function or modify our parse flag function here so that it can handle Boolean flags just like flags that expect a value, okay? So what we're going to do is we're just going to add some extra arguments onto here. And for this third argument, what we'll do is we'll actually pass an is required flag onto there. And then after that, we'll add a has value argument here and we'll just give that a default argument and we'll make that default to true. Okay, so in other words, if we say has value is false, then that'll mean that it's just a Boolean flag and we just want to know whether the flag is there or not. So we'll want this parse flag thing to just return true or false. Okay, so what we're going to do here, the first thing we're going to do is take a look at this is required argument. And all we're going to have to do is add this to the if statement. So we'll say if is required and the flag isn't there, then and only then will we want to log out an error and exit the process. And so what we're going to want to do, we're going to want to check and make sure that we actually have a flag index before we do this here with the value. So we'll say if flag index is greater than or equal to zero, then we know we have it and we can do the rest of our stuff here. All right, so we'll get the value and return it and all that good stuff. All right, so what we're doing here is once we know that the flag index is greater than or equal to zero, right? So that flag was in there, but we're only going to want to do this if this fourth argument here has value is true, right? All right, so what we're going to want to do is we're going to add this to the if statement. So we'll say if flag index is greater than or equal to zero and has value, then and only then are we going to want to get the value and print out an error if the value isn't there and return the value, okay? Otherwise, if it doesn't have a value and the flag index is greater than or equal to zero, that means it's a Boolean flag, so we're just going to want to return true or false. And the easiest way to do that is just by saying return flag index is greater than or equal to zero. Now, we are checking this in quite a few different places, so I'm sure that there's a way that we could refactor this function to be a little bit cleaner. But actually, we're going to be replacing this function later on with something more exciting, so I'm not going to spend too much time doing that, all right? So let's see if this parse flag function works or if there's something that I've overlooked that we need to uh, modify. Is We're going to leave our let name equals parse flag name thing, and let's also say let, and we'll come up with some kind of Boolean condition, all right? So what we'll do is we'll say something like um, is morning. And we'll just have this be a flag that will change the greeting that we'll print out for our name, right? So we'll say good morning if it's morning. We'll just say hello if it's not. All right, so we'll say let is morning and we'll make this parse flag and say dash dash morning. And then we'll pass the args, of course, along with the is required. So is required is obviously going to be false and the has value is going to be false as well. And up here, of course, for our name argument parsing, we're going to need to say is required. And for this one, we'll say true. And for the has value, since the default value for that is true, we don't need to even specify that. Okay, so let's try this out. And before we actually print out any kind of greeting or anything, let's just print out the values of name and is morning just to make sure everything is working. So we'll say console.log. And then as an object, we'll say name and is morning, which will allow us to see their respective values. So let's run this again. We'll say uh, node index.js, and then we'll say something like dash dash name, Sean, and we'll say dash dash morning like so and hit enter. And sure enough, it looks like the two values of those are good. So let's try running this with the flags reversed. All right, so we'll put morning before the name flag and hit enter. And sure enough, we get the same thing. And let's try leaving the morning thing off. We should see that is morning is false. 
And if we leave the name off, then we should see that we get an error. And if we add the name flag without a value, we should see this error as well. All right, so it looks like everything is working pretty well here. So what we should be able to do is use our parse flag function now to greet this person by name. So what we're gonna do is now that we have the name and his morning, we're just gonna say console.log. And then in back ticks here, we'll start off by using a ternary operator. So we'll say is morning, and we'll use that to select between good morning and uh, hello. And then we'll put a comma after that and put the person's name. Okay, so pretty simple script. Let's try running it again with some different combinations. Let's start off by doing it right and saying name Sean and with the morning flag. And sure enough, we see good morning Sean. If we remove the morning flag, we'll see hello Sean. And uh, if we change the name to something else, Joe, for example, we'll see hello Joe. And if we add the morning flag on again, we'll see good morning Joe. All right, so everything seems to be working now with our new Boolean flag functionality, which we added here along with our has value argument. So the next thing that we're gonna do is, is we're gonna need to give ourselves a way to handle arguments that have multiple values. So we saw that we'll wanna add a numbers argument with the values one, two, and three, for example, and be able to actually get the values of each of those arguments. So what this is gonna look like is we're gonna need to pass in some kind of argument to parse flag and already it's getting a little bit complicated here with uh, five arguments we're up to so again later on probably in another section we're, we're going to see a much more straightforward way of allowing ourselves to parse command line arguments but for now what we'll do is we'll just add another argument that'll be something like number of values and by default we'll just have that equal to one okay and yes, this is a bit of a repeat of has value, right? This makes has value a little bit redundant, but just to keep things simple for ourselves, just leave those as separate arguments. Okay, so where this number of values thing is gonna come into play is down here when we wanna actually get the values of our arguments. What we're gonna wanna do is instead of using just a single index as we're doing here, we're gonna wanna use JavaScript's slice function in order to get more elements from the array, all right? So what we're gonna wanna do is say let value and we're gonna wanna check the number of values argument, all right? So we'll say number of values and use a ternary operator here. If number of values is equal to one, then of course we're gonna wanna do what we were doing before. Otherwise, what we're gonna wanna do is say arguments dot slice and we're gonna wanna start at the flag index plus one and we're gonna to wanna to end at the flag index plus one plus the number of values. Okay, so this tells us where to stop getting values for this flag index. All right, now this does complicate things further down, of course, because now not only do we have to check to see whether the value exists and whether the value starts with this double dash thing, but if there are more than one value, we have to make sure that this array is the length we expect it to be, right, which would be the equivalent of this, and we also have to make sure that none of the values in the array are another flag. Okay, so this is actually getting a little bit complicated. So what I'm gonna do is split this into two different if statements. So what we'll do is we'll just have a nested if statement and say if number of values is equal to one, and we'll wanna just do what we were doing before. So we'll just say let value equals, and then we'll have our args thing here. And then we're just gonna have a separate if statement down here saying if number of values is greater than one. And in that case, what we would wanna do is say let value equals args.slice blah, blah, blah. Okay, now this if statement here is gonna go inside our other if statement here. So yes, we do have quite a bit of nested if statements. It's kind of ugly, but it's something we could definitely go on and refactor. But, but just to make things easier, I'm gonna leave it for now. All right, so that should take care of our number of values equal to one. So the next thing we're gonna need to look at is if our number of values is greater than one, we already have the values here as an array. So what we're gonna wanna do is check those two things that I mentioned before, right? To make sure that the array is the length we want it to be and to make sure that none of those values in the array is another flag. So what we'll do is we'll say if values.length does not equal number of values, right? So that would be if the person included too few arguments after that, and that was the end of the arguments. 
or if any of the values contains this little double dash thing. And to check this, what we can do, and I'm just going to uh, indent this to make it a little bit easier to read. We're gonna say or values dot sum, and we would say sum value value dot starts with, and we'll say the double dash thing there. All right, so that's gonna be our if statement. And in that case, we're gonna to wanna to do the same thing and just print out an error and exit. So we'll copy these and add that here. And then just to uh, add a little bit more communication, we'll say the flag name flag requires, and we'll have the number of values, values. Okay, so this function is getting a little bit large, but if you read down into each of these if statements, you can see that each of them is just representing a specific case, right? So the case up here is if the flag is required and it's not there. Our case down here is if we found the flag and it's supposed to have a value, and it's supposed to only have one value is this if statement here. And then if it has more values, we see up here. Oh, and also we need to move this return value statement up into our top if statement. We'll just do it like that. And we'll also need to say return values inside our other one here, just by saying return values like so. Okay, so let's test this out. What we're gonna wanna do is add another parse flag call for our numbers. So we'll say let numbers equals parse flag, and we'll wanna parse the numbers flag, and we're gonna pass the args. It's going to be required, we'll say, and it's supposed to have a value, so we'll say true, true, and the number of values here, we'll say that that's three. Okay, so now that we have our numbers, what we're gonna wanna do, of course, uh, is first of all, we'll need to convert them into numbers because by default, they're just strings. So we'll say let number args, and then we can say let numbers equals, and we'll say number args dot map. We'll map each arg into a number like so. And then what we'll do is we'll just add our numbers together by passing them to our add function, just like we did before. Okay, so we'll just uncomment all of that stuff down here. And that should be all we need to do. In fact, let's move the number arg stuff down to here, just to make it a little bit more readable and put it in the right place. Okay, so as you can see, our program here is doing quite a few things. First of all, it's getting the name and finding out whether it's mourning from a flag, it's greeting the person, and then what it's doing is it's getting the numbers and it's adding them together. So. Let's try this again. What we're gonna do is, is say node.js index.js. We'll add a name, we'll say morning, and we'll add some numbers. We'll say one, two, and three, and hit enter. And sure enough, we'll see good morning, Sean, and the result of calling add with one, two, and three is six. Okay, so let's try this again and do something wrong with our numbers flag, just to make sure that everything's working there. So let's remove the last number there and hit enter. What we should see is that it says the numbers flag requires three values. And as you can see, we only have two. So let's try uh, just removing the numbers flag altogether. Sure enough, we'll see the numbers flag with a value is required. The next thing that we'll wanna do is say dash dash numbers. And let's try uh, saying one, two, and then adding another flag. We'll just say another like so. And sure enough, we should see this same warning again, saying that the numbers flag requires three values. So anyway, we've now seen how to work with Boolean flags, as well as how to work with flags that take multiple arguments. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. We've seen elsewhere how to use command line arguments in our Node programs in order to allow whoever is running the program, whether that's us or another developer, to specify the data that that program is gonna be operating on, right? Now, command line arguments, as we've seen, make our programs a lot more flexible because they make it so that we don't have to hard code the data into our programs. However, one thing about command line arguments is that basically you have to specify them at the very beginning when you're running the program by saying node index.js, for example, and then after that, whatever arguments you wanna pass in. 
And this can be a little bit inconvenient at times because there are certain situations where you won't actually want to get input from the user, right? And by user, I mean whoever is running the program until the program is already running and has already processed something, right? So an example of this might be if your program is meant to load some data from an API and it can't reach the API, so it wants to know what the user uh, wants the program to do, right? Should it try it again or should it quit? Well, in that case, we need the ability to get input from the user while the program is running, which is something uh, that you can't really do with command line arguments. So in order to do this, we're going to be using another built-in Node.js package, which is called readline. And this basically allows us to get input from the user, uh, the user that's running the program, as the program is running. And this is a very, very widely used package. Chances are you've seen it before. Uh, so without further ado, let's just jump right in and see how to use it. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna take a look at here is how to get input from the user while the program is running. All right, so previously we saw how to get input from the user via command line arguments, right? Which basically just meant that if the user runs our code and passes some extra arguments, and these can either be regular arguments or flag arguments as we saw, but basically in this case, all of the data is passed in at the very beginning when the user runs the program. Now, all right, now there might be a lot of reasons why we would want to get input from the user while the program is running. And this could include things like if our program runs into some kind of error, right? If our program's trying to, you know, uh, maybe do some file manipulation and it runs into a file system error. Instead of crashing, we might want our program to just, you know, ask the user, hey, what do you want me to do now? Do you want me to try this again? Or do you want me to move on? Or do you want me to quit? Okay, so that's one case where you know, we might want to get input from a user during the program. Another case would simply be for convenience, right? So if we have a lot of different arguments in our program, right? Let's say we want to get the person's first name, last name, middle name, credit card number, address, etc. Well, that's obviously way too much information to expect someone to specify as command line arguments, right? That would just be a very, very long command and it would be pretty error prone if the user types something in wrong. They would have to, you know, do that obnoxious thing where they have to use the arrow keys, go back in the command and correct something, okay? So in situations like that, it's usually easier if instead of expecting the user to pass things in as arguments, we just let the user run the program and then our program will collect those things, those pieces of data one at a time. Now a good example of this is the npm init command, right? If we want to initialize our current directory as a new npm package, then if we just run npm init, well, what this is going to do is it's going to collect our input one at a time, right? So we can specify what we want the package name to be, what we want the version to be, what we want the description to be, what we want the git repository to be, and so on and so forth. Whereas, you know, if we had to specify all of these things as arguments with the npm init command, that would end up just being a very long and cumbersome command to type out. And chances are people would end up typing one or two arguments wrong and that would just cause the whole thing not to work. So, so anyway, those are just a few examples of reasons why we would want to collect input from the user while our program is running. But obviously there are a lot of other situations as well, right? So one possibility that I'm pretty excited about is the possibility of actually creating command line games, right? So we can create games like the Hunt the Wumpus game, if you have heard of that, if not Google it, it's just an old uh, command line based game that was created way back uh, when computers were a fairly new thing, right? So that's just another possibility, right? That we could create command line games where we collect input from the user at various points throughout the game. And you know, the possibilities there are pretty limitless. So anyway, I think at this point, I've probably convinced you of the importance of being able to collect input from the user as our program is running. So the next thing that we're gonna take a look at is how we actually go about doing that. All right, and all of this code here is from a previous section where we saw how to parse different command line arguments. What I'm gonna do for now is just comment 
um, some of this code out. Specifically, I'm going to comment out this uh, parse flag function that we created. And I'm going to just delete everything else, all right? So that was all just for parsing command line arguments. And because we are gonna be making changes to that later on, I'm just going to leave that function there in case we happen to need it, okay? And here, I'll just push that down to the bottom so it doesn't distract us too much. All right, so collecting input from the user as our program is running is something that's done by using Node.js's built-in read line package, all right? So this is just a standard module that's included with Node.js. And as the name would suggest, what it allows us to do is easily collect input from the user via the console. All right, so first of all, the way that we import the read line package is fairly straightforward. We're just gonna say import read line from read line, okay? And by the way, if you wanna use import export syntax as I'm doing here, you're gonna want to make sure that in your package.json you have type set to module, all right? So you might have to add that line there if you try this and you get some kind of error about the import keyword. Okay, so anyway, now that we have read line imported, the next thing that we have to do is create what's called an interface, all right? So an interface in the case of our read line function is basically just something that read line can get information from and print information to. So the way that we create an interface using the read line package is by saying something like let interface equals read line dot create interface, okay? And the way that we use this create interface function, we're gonna pass it an object that basically needs to have two properties. The first property is a property called input. And this basically tells readline where this interface is going to be getting its input from. All right, so in the case of getting data from a user while the program is running, this is going to be the console. And in order to specify that here, and in this case, what we're gonna do is say process.standardIn. All right, now standard in is just the standard input. And in our case here, when we're running Node.js from the command line, that's just going to be the command line, okay? So now that we have that, what we're gonna do next is say output. And the output here is going to be process.standardout, right? And again, in this case, that's going to be the console where this read line is going to output things. Okay, and um, actually now that I've defined interface, something that I realized is, is that interface is actually a reserved JavaScript keyword in certain contexts. So we're gonna remove that and rename this to something like RL, all right? This is a pretty common abbreviation that you'll see used for read line. Okay, so now that we've created this read line interface, we can start using it to get input from the user. So let's say that our program is running and to simulate this, we'll just say console.log running. And let's say now that we want to ask the user something, right? Let's say we want to ask the user their name so that we can greet them. All right, well, in order to do that, what we're gonna do is use this read line interface that we just created, and we're gonna use a method called question. All right, so when we say rl.question, what this does is it will actually give the user a prompt in the console. So we could say something like, hello, what's your name? All right, and here I need to uh, use the escape character here to get the apostrophe, what's your name? And the way that this question method is gonna work is it's going to print out this prompt to the user in the console and the user is going to type something in as an answer. Now the answer, once the user enters that answer, which is just gonna be a string and hits enter, then we're gonna need to pass a callback function to question that will handle whatever they typed in. Okay, so in this case, we'll say response, and inside this callback, response is going to be whatever string the user entered into the console as an answer to this question, all right? So that's how the question function works here. So what we could do is we know that the response is just gonna be the user's name, so we could say console.log, and then we could say something like uh, here, if we use back ticks, we'll say, it's nice to meet you. And we'll put in the user's name, which is the response. Okay, so if we run this program now, what we're gonna see is, let's just do node index.js. We'll see that it prints out running, all right? All right, so the console.log statement here 
prints out immediately, and then it's going to print out this prompt that we specified here, asking us what our name is. So if we enter in our name, we'll say Sean, and you'll notice that there isn't a space here. We might want to add that into the prompt here just for uh, the future. So let's hit enter now, and we'll see, sure enough, that it says, it's nice to meet you, Sean, and the program just kind of ends there. Okay, now the reason that the program didn't end is because after you set up a read line interface as we've done here, you need to call RL dot close when you're done with it, right? So in other words, if this is the last question that you need from the user, you're gonna wanna just say RL dot close, and that will end the program, right? Because otherwise, as you can see, read line is just gonna be sitting there listening for further responses. Okay, so let's uh, just use control C to exit out of this and try it again. We'll say note index.js, and again, we'll see running, hello, what's your name? If we enter our name, then we'll see that it says, it's nice to meet you, Sean, and the program will end, all right? So that's what rl.close does. It stops the program from just sitting there listening after we've already answered the question. All right, so that's how we get a single piece of input from the user. But let's say that we want to get several different pieces of information, right? Let's say that, for example, we want to get the user's first name, last name, and, uh, well, middle initial, okay? So we'll get the user's first name, middle initial, and last name. And using this strategy, the way that we would have to do that is we would have to first ask what the user's first name is. So we would say, hello, what's your first name? Once we get the response, which we would probably want to rename to first name, then what we could do is say rl.question again and ask the next question, which would be, and what, and we'll do the escape character for the apostrophe there. And what's your middle initial? Okay, and we'll put a space there as well. And then we'll do the same thing and have the callback. We'll have the middle initial as the data that we're getting from the user. And then once we've gotten the middle initial, the next thing that we'll want to do is say rl.question. And then we would say, and what is your last name? Okay, there we go, last name. And then we would have the last name. And once we've done that, we have all three of those pieces of information and we can do something like, I don't know, print out the user's full name, let's say. So what that would look like is we would just say console.log and we would say in backticks, your full name is, and then we would say first name and then we would have the middle initial. So. We'll put a space there and say middle initial and we'll put a period after that. And then we'll say last name. Okay, and that should work. And of course, at this point, we would wanna close the read line interface by saying rl.close. And oh, the last thing, we need to change this last here to last name. Okay, so let's try this one now. We're gonna run our program again. We'll say node index.js and we'll see that it says, hello, what's your first name? We'll put in our first name. Next, it's gonna ask us what our middle initial is. Mine is P and then it will ask us for our last name and we forgot the space there, but no matter, it will work just the same. And I'll type in my last name and then it will print out your full name is Sean P. Wassell. Okay, so our program is working here and it's gathering several pieces of data. So let's just add in the last space for our last prompt here. And uh, one thing that you're gonna notice here is that we're dealing with the same kind of callback hell that we tend to see when we're doing any kind of callback intensive operations in Node.js, right? So basically whenever we're doing multiple asynchronous things one after the other and getting the results in a callback. Now, in order to remedy this situation, the readline package actually does provide us with the option of using promises for this RL dot question function. And that's something that we're going to take a look at next. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've seen how to use the rl.question function in order to get input from the user, we saw that this can easily lead to callback hell if you're not careful, 
if you need to ask several questions in a row, right? So what I said earlier is that Node actually provides a promises version of, of this read line package that allows us to use async await or you know just regular promise syntax with this function instead of having to use callback. Now, one thing to note is that this functionality is only available in Node.js versions 17 and up. And currently I'm using version 16, 14. So if like me, you have a version that's before that, and, and this may or may not be true if you're watching this later, if you wanna update the version of Node, but you still wanna remain on the long-term support version, which for me, this is currently the long-term support version, then what I would recommend doing is using a tool called NVM, that's Node Version Manager. Now you can find the Node Version Manager just by going to nvm.sh, and, and that will most likely take you to the NVM GitHub page. And this GitHub page contains a lot of information about how to use the Node Version Manager, etc. But what you're gonna to wanna to look for is the installing and updating section. And you're gonna to wanna to select whatever script here fits your operating system, all right? So I'm gonna use curl. And what I'm gonna do is just copy this and then head over to my terminal and paste it and run it. And that should install NVM for us. Okay, so now that we've installed NVM, what you're actually gonna to have to do is open a new terminal and close this previous one in order for that to take effect. All right, so we'll just delete that terminal and you should be able to type NVM now and see a bunch of stuff printed out, okay? So the entire purpose of NVM in the first place is allow us to quickly and easily switch between node versions, all right? So in this case, we wanna try something out that's not in the node version that we currently have installed on our machine but we don't necessarily want to permanently switch to that version either, right? We don't wanna permanently use version 18 until it's the long-term support version in many cases. So with NVM, what we can do is we can just say NVM use 18 and hit enter. And what we'll see first of all is that it's gonna say version 18 is not yet installed. All right, so the first thing that you're gonna to wanna to do with NVM is install the version of Node that you wanna use. And for us, that's gonna be NVM install and we'll say 18. Okay, so what you'll see is that it will automatically download the latest subversion of the version that we specify here, which currently is 18.2. And now that we have that installed, we should be able to say NVM use 18. And now we'll see now using node 18.2. So what this means is that if we type node-v now, this node command will actually be node version 18.2 instead of 16.14, which is what we saw earlier. Okay, so what this means now is that when we run our script, right, node index.js, we're gonna be running that using node version 18 instead of node version 16, which will now allow us to use the promises version of read line. So the way that this is gonna work now is we just need to say import read line from, and we're gonna need to change this thing here. now. One of the more recent developments in Node.js is that for some of the built-in packages, you're supposed to preface the name, such as readline, with node and a colon here. So you're gonna say node readline slash promises. Okay, and this should give us the promises version. And for one reason or another, they changed the way that we're supposed to import readline to import star as readline from node readline promises. Okay, so anyway, there's a few changes there that we had to make, but now that we've done that, we should be able to use readline.question as a promise or an asynchronous function. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna skip right to using async await because that's quite frankly the easiest way to use rl.question. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna define an asynchronous function, which we'll just call something like run, and it's going to be async, of course, so we'll say async. And all of our code that needs the await keyword will go inside of this, okay? So what we can do now is we, instead of doing the callbacks, we can say let first name equals rl.question, what's your first name? And we no longer even need that callback, okay? So it's just gonna look like this. For our middle initial, we can say let middle initial equals rl.question, and then we don't need the callback anymore here either. And then for our last name, we can just say, uh, here we go, we can just say let last name equals rl.question and we don't need 
the callback anymore here either. Now we are gonna need the await keyword with all of these. So what you're gonna wanna do is just say await rl.question, await rl.question, and await rl.question. And then once we've gotten the first name, middle initial, and last name, we can simply use those in console.log without putting this inside a callback. And we can say rl.close once that's done, okay? So all we need to do now is call this run function by saying run, and that should execute all of our code for us. So let's just open up our terminal here and say node index.js. And sure enough, what we'll see is that it will do the same thing. So we'll say, hello, what's your first name? What's your middle initial? And what's your last name? And then it will give us the answer and close. All right, so using promises like this is much easier to read and much easier to manage than callbacks because as you can see, it allows us to write our code all in the same scope instead of having to have one more callback function for each and every prompt, right? So, you know, if we have 10 different prompts that we want to go through, this makes it a lot easier than what we saw before. Okay, so that's how to use the read line promises package, which automatically adds promises. And as we've seen is only available, I believe in versions 17 and up for Node. So let's say that you're still in Node 16 or maybe an earlier version even, right? This is a pretty common thing if you're working at a company that hasn't upgraded Node or something like that. Uh, well, your question in that case might be, is there a way to convert rl.question to a promise without having to use the read line promises package? Well, I'm happy to report that the answer to that is yes. So what we're gonna do is we're going to switch our node version back to uh, 16. So we'll say NVM use 16 and hit enter. And actually it looks like that's not installed for us. So let's say NVM install 16. And we'll see that that downloads and installs 16.15. So I was one minor version behind there. And once that's installed, let's just say NVM use 16 and hit enter. Now we'll be back at node 16. So if you say node V, so you'll see that that prints out version 16.15. All right, so if we try and run our index.js code now, what you'll see is that we get an error saying that there's no such module node read line slash promises. And that's because, as I said, this isn't available in Node 16, at least not at the time that I'm recording this. So anyway, if we wanna change the rl.question function to a promise without using the readline promises package, right? Again, if we're in a situation where we're not able to upgrade to a later version of Node, then what you can do is you can simply use the way that promises work to make this happen. So. Um, you know, if you're not familiar with promises or if you're not familiar with some of the trickier details of promises, don't worry too much about this right now. Just know that this will do what we want it to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to say let question. And what this is going to be is a function that will take a prompt as an argument. All right. So that'll be the string here that we want to display to the user. And what it's going to do is it's going to return a new promise. So we'll say return new promise. And we're gonna pass the promise callback to this promise. Again, if you're not familiar with how this works, don't worry too much about it. Just know that the promise callback has two main arguments. Those are resolve and reject. And in this case, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna say rl.question. All right, so this is the original rl.question function. Then we're going to pass the prompt as the first argument. And as the second argument, we're gonna have the response that the user enters for that prompt. And we're just gonna call resolve with that response, okay? So again, don't worry if you don't understand this, just know that this code here will create this new question function that will be the promise version of this rl.question function. Okay, so what we can do now is simply go through here, convert this to await question, await question and await question. And if we did everything correctly here, it should give us the same functionality that we saw earlier with node 18, except obviously in this case, we didn't have to upgrade. So let's try running this again. We're gonna say node index.js. And sure enough, we'll see that it will say, hello, what's your first name? And if we enter in that information, we'll see that it will work just like before.
Okay, so that's how to work with rl.question as a promise. And obviously the original promise syntax, right, by saying dot then or dot catch would work with this as well, but I usually tend to prefer using async and await just because it's much easier to write. And you know, it really just allows you to write your code as a simple straightforward series of steps in this case. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've seen how to convert our question function here to a promise and use that to collect data from the user, the next thing that I wanna take a look at is a strategy for gathering a lot of pieces of information from the user at once, all right? So as you can guess, gathering all this information from the user piece by piece, right? By calling question, 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 and specifying each question individually, can get pretty tedious when you need to collect a lot of information, right? So if we had to collect, you know, let's say 10 pieces of information, then we'd have to just have 10 lines here where we're calling await question, await question, await question, blah, 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 blah. And that's obviously a bit of a pain. So in situations like this, and they will come up quite often where you need to collect a lot of information from the user, it's usually better to approach this in the following way. What we're gonna do here is instead of explicitly asking each question by calling our question function, we're gonna just create an array of objects representing each question, and we're gonna basically loop through that array and use that to gather all of the information from the user instead. So here's what this is gonna look like, and this is just one strategy for doing this. There are obviously a lot of other ways, but you know, this is just a, a way that makes a lot of sense to me. So let's start off here and we'll say let questions. And what this is gonna be, as I said, is just an array of strings and it's gonna be all of the questions that we wanna ask, all right? So we'll have, what's your first name? For the second one, we'll have, what's your middle initial? All right, so we'll just uh, add a comma there and paste the second one. And then for the third one here, we'll say, and what's your last name? And those are gonna be our three questions. Okay, so now that we have our questions in an array like this, what we can actually do is instead of hard coding each of these question calls, we can just loop through our questions and we'll say four. And we're gonna to want to loop through all of our questions by saying let question of questions. And then inside here, we're just gonna call that question function that we created, right? That's gonna be our asynchronous version of this, our promise version instead of the actual version itself, although in theory you could use that as well. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say let response equals, and actually let's call this something besides question because we have our question function up here. In fact, let's just change this to ask question to make it a little bit more clear what we're actually doing when we call this thing. So we'll say let question of questions and then our response is gonna be equals ask question and we're going to pass the current question to that function as the argument. All right, now we're gonna to need to add a wait here. And what that means is that we're also gonna to have to make this for loop asynchronous. Now, when you have asynchronous code inside a for loop, all you need to do is add the await keyword after for, right? So for await basically just tells JavaScript that there's gonna be some kind of asynchronous logic inside that. And what it will do is it'll actually wait for each asynchronous thing to happen before going on to the next question, all right? So in other words, this is going to wait for the user to answer each question before it goes on to the next one, which is what we want. Okay, so on each of these, what we're doing is we're getting the response to our question. And what that means is that we'll want to push this response onto some kind of array, all right? So what that'll look like, we'll just say something like let responses equals, and we'll start that off as an empty array. And then every new response we get, we'll just say responses dot push, and we'll push the new response onto that array. Okay, so once we've completed all of the questions, what we're gonna be left with is an array containing all of the responses that the user answered, right? So it'll have the first name, middle initial, and last name, but they're gonna be in an array instead of in these variable names as we saw. Now, there's a few ways we can handle this. The first way would just be to say, responses index zero, and then for the middle initial, 
we would say responses index one. And then for the last name, we would say responses index two. Now, if we run this, we'll see that this will work just like before, right? So we'll see what's your first name, Sean, what's your middle initial P, what's your last name, Wassell, hit enter. And we'll see that that gives us the exact answer that we had before when everything was hard coded line by line. But you know, in this case, we kind of lose the actual identification for what each of these responses is. So there's a few ways to get around this. One way would simply be to say, let first name, middle initial, and last name, right? And use array destructuring to actually get those responses. So we could just say responses like so, and then we could change this back to first name. All right, so we'll change that to first name, then middle initial, like so, and then our last name will be here. And if we try this again, we'll see that this works. So John, uh, let's see, A, Doe, something like that. And we would see that that would work just like before. So the point here is that doing things this way allows us to write all of our questions in an array, and we could possibly even have this in some kind of file, right? Maybe a text file or an Excel document that we can change. And by doing that, that would allow us to actually change the questions dynamically, right? Without having to actually change the code of the program itself. And I'm not going to show you how to do that right now, but all you would need to do is put these questions in a file, read out all of the lines from the file and put them in this array and then use the same strategy that we saw here before. Okay, so anyway, I said that there was another way besides this to get all of the responses as variables. And the way that we're gonna do that is basically by changing our questions array here into an array of objects, right? So currently it's an array of strings, but what we can actually do is change it to an array of objects and what each of these will allow us to do is specify the variable name that we want the answer, right? The user's response to be assigned to. All right, so in this case, we could specify the key first name, and I'm choosing the key name key here for reasons that you'll see in a minute. Um, and then what we would do is we would just say something like prompt, and that would be the actual question that we wanna ask. Now, if we rewrite each of our questions to include this extra key, right? So middle initial, for example, and then we have the prompt and we'll do that with the last one here with our last name. We'll say key last name and the prompt will be, and what's your last name? All right. So if we do that, then what this allows us to do is actually put the user's responses into an object instead of an array. Now, this is really helpful because what it lets us avoid doing is relying on the positions of responses in this responses array. So let me just show you what this would look like. The first thing that we would wanna do, of course, is change this to an empty object. And then what we would do is for each question that we ask, we would get the response, right? So we would say, ask question, this would be question.prompt. And then instead of just pushing the response onto an array, we would say responses, and we would set that to question.key, and we would set that equal to whatever the response was, right? So the end result here would be an object that would have the keys, first name, middle initial, and last name, and the values for each of those would be whatever the user's response was, all right? So uh, what this will look like now is if we just print out the responses object, and I'm just gonna comment out this other console log line for a minute. If we say console.log, responses and run our code again. If we put in a name, first name, middle initial, last name, we'll see that this gives us an object with the first name, middle initial, and last name from what the user entered, all right? So this here is gonna be much easier for us, generally speaking, to work with than an array of the user's responses because we know just by the label what each of these things is and we can refer to each of these things by that label later on. All right, so now if we wanted to print out the first name, middle, initial, last name, we could just say responses.firstname, responses.middle initial, and responses.last name. And if we run our code again and uh, just enter in those values again, then we would see that that would give us the same result. Okay? 
Now, the last thing that I wanna do here, now that we've seen how to loop through uh, a series of objects like this with keys and prompts is actually write a standalone function that will take care of this for us, all right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say function and we'll call this function something like uh, multi-prompt or something like that, all right? Doesn't have to be that name, but it'll work. Okay, and all that this function is gonna do is take a series of question objects like the ones that we've specified up here and it's going to loop through them and basically do what we did down here. So all we're gonna to have to do is copy this code. All right, I'm just going to cut that code out of there, paste it in our multi-prompt function, and then instead of logging out this thing at the end, which I'll actually put back here in our run function, we're gonna replace that with return responses. All right, so we're just gonna return that responses object from our multi-prompt function. And since this is asynchronous going on here, we're gonna to need to add the async keyword to our function. And then all we need to do is inside run, we, we can just say let first name, and you know, I'm using object destructuring here to make this a little more readable. First name, middle initial, and last name equals await multi-prompt. And then we would just pass our questions from above to here and we can now remove responses.firstName, responses.middleInitial, and responses.lastName. And if we run our code one more time, we should be able to enter in the same values, and we'll see that that will print out our name. All right, so what we've done here is we've built a simple multi-prompt function that takes a series of questions and it will return an object that gives us all of the user's responses to each of those questions. And each of those responses is identified by a unique key that we specified in the questions here as well. All right, so this is a pretty useful thing. And with this function, you could potentially write a lot of useful applications for gathering information from users. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've looked at a strategy for asking multiple questions in a nice, easy way, right, by defining our questions as a series of objects and then just looping through them and storing the responses in an object uh, so that we can access all of those responses later, the last thing that I wanna take a look at here is how to allow users to input multi-line responses with the read line package, all right? so. So far, whenever we've asked the user to input some kind of answer, it's been, you know, just a simple one line response, right? And as soon as they hit enter, it goes on to the next one, goes on to the next one, goes on to the next one, and we're done, okay? But there might be certain situations where you want to allow the user to type something a little bit longer, right? So you want them to be able to put in multiple lines at once, and only then do you want to actually process their responses, okay? Now, there's actually two main ways to do that. The first way would be to simply use the readline.question function multiple times in a row until the user puts in, you know, like a empty line or something. So let's take a look at that strategy first. And the next strategy that we're gonna see after that is using a completely different function on the readline package called rl.on. All right, so, Starting off here, what we're gonna do is sort of pretend that this multi-prompt and questions thing doesn't exist, and we're just going to write our own code now, all right? So you can just comment out this code down here if you want, or uh, you know, you can delete it or leave it around, whatever you want, but what I'm gonna do is delete it, and what I'm gonna do instead is start off with a variable called response lines, and this is just gonna be an empty array, all right? So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna just keep looping until the user enters an empty line. That'll be sort of our signal that the user is done entering lines and will be done. All right, so for this one, we're gonna probably want to use a while loop. And basically we're just gonna want to loop through this while the last line in response lines is not an empty string, all right? And so for that, all we're gonna do is say response lines.length is greater than zero. Okay, so as long as there's at least one line there and the last line, which will be response lines index response lines dot length minus one is not equal to an empty string. 
All right, so as long as that's true, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get the response from the user and we're just gonna say ask question. And basically all we're gonna do is just ask an empty question, all right? So we'll just keep asking this empty question and whenever the user responds, so we're gonna add the response onto this response lines array. All right, so what this will look like is we'll say let new line equals ask question and we're gonna need the await keyword here. And then what we'll do is on every new line, we'll just say response lines dot push new line. All right, now in order to get the first response and actually ask the real question, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say let first line equals, and then we're gonna say await ask question, and here's where our real question will be, right? So we could say something like, tell me about yourself, and that's where the user will start typing. And once we've added response lines dot push, and we'll add the first line there, we'll be able to start looping through. And I guess after adding this, we don't even need this response lines dot length thing. So we can just remove that. And then we'll just be left with response lines dot length minus one does not equal empty array. And actually, now that I think about it, this would be a great situation for using the do while loop. So let's just put this condition at the end and we'll make this a do while loop instead of just a while loop. And that's pretty much all we need to do. So now we can just remove this first line thing and, and we'll check that the last response is not an empty string after the user puts in each of them. And then when we're done with that, of course, we're gonna want to just print out something like, uh, I don't know, we'll say console.log. Hmm, interesting. And then we'll have our program actually output everything that the user has typed in, right? So we'll say console.log and then using backticks here, we'll say, apparently you say that, and then we'll just put in whatever the user entered. So we'll say response lines, and we'll join them together using, uh, let's say a space, I suppose, and that'll be it. Okay, so let's try this now. We're gonna run our program, and nothing's gonna happen because actually we removed the first part where we actually print something out in the prompt, right? So let's, uh, let's say response lines, dot length is greater than zero. So that's where we'll do that. And if it is greater than zero, we're just gonna have an empty response or an empty prompt rather. If it is empty, then we're going to say, tell me about yourself, okay? Like that. And that should be all we need to do. So let's quit this and try it again. And sure enough, we see that it says, tell me about yourself. So you could say, well, I like to program and then you can say, and I also like to eat food, and that's about it. Okay, so now when we hit enter twice, it should detect that we're done typing and it'll say, hmm, interesting. Apparently you say that, blah, 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 blah. And grammatically that doesn't really make sense now that I think about it, but you know, the point here is that we allowed the user to enter in multiple lines and we were able to store those up in an array and print them all out by joining them together, okay? So anyway, that's the first way that we can allow ourselves to get multiple lines from a user for a single question, right? Is literally just by looping through, calling our ask question function, which remember behind the scenes calls rl.question and basically just detecting when they're done by having them enter an empty string, okay? So that's only one way to do it though. And frankly, it's not always the nicest way to go about it, right? As you can see, we had to do some strange logical things to get that to work. So the next way to do it is using a function called rl.on, all right? Now the way that rl.on works, in order to see that, what I'm actually gonna do is comment out this whole run function because we don't actually need to use the rl.question function in order to make this happen. What we need to do instead is say rl.on, and basically what this does is it will allow us to tap into an event whenever the user enters a new line, right? So in order to do that, we're gonna say rl.on line, and then what we do is we simply pass a callback here that will say something like new line, and the way that this works is 
as I said, whenever the user enters a new line into the console, this callback will get called with whatever that string was, and we can choose to do whatever we want with it. All right, so what that could look like is we could simply log out the result there. Every time they enter a new line, we'll just say new line. And in fact, just to make this a little more interesting, we'll say you said new line, like so. And now if we run our code again, what we'll see is that whenever we enter a string, it'll sort of echo whatever we say, right? So we could say goodbye. Oops, I didn't spell goodbye right, but you get the idea. And once we're done, we can just hit control C and that will close it. All right, so perhaps you can see how this would work in getting a multi-line response. Basically, we would just keep doing that and accumulating new lines. All right, so outside of here, we could say let response lines equals empty array. And each time the user enters a new line, we could say something like response lines dot push new line. And then we could come up with some kind of stopping condition so that we could basically close our read line. And in order to do that, we would just have to say something like uh, if new line is equal to an empty string. And here's where we would actually print something out. We would say console.log. And then we could say you said and just sort of join together all of their content by saying response lines dot join with, with an empty string as the argument. And then we would call rl dot close, which would end the program. All right. Otherwise, of course, we would want to say response lines dot push new line. Oh, and here we would say uh, else for that and put that inside of there. And that's all we need. All right. So now if we run our program, what we'll see is that well, first of all, we need to actually print something out. So we'll just say something like console.log tell me about yourself, dot, dot, dot. So now if we run our code again, we'll see that it'll say, tell me about yourself. And we can say, my name is Sean, hit enter. I like programming and that's it, okay? And now if we hit enter twice, we'll see that it says, you said, my name is Sean, I like programming, that's it. And that's the end of our program, okay? So as you can see, this is another way to gather multiple line input from a user. Now you might be wondering how we could go about modifying this, this multi-prompt function in order to allow multi-line responses for certain questions. All right, well, in order to do that, the first thing we would probably want to do is add some sort of extra property to these objects here that would tell our program that the response for the prompt should be multi-line, all right? So what that might look like, we might want to allow users to specify a biography and the prompt might be something like write a short bio, like so. And then, I don't know, maybe we have a multi-line property that says true. And when this says true, we're just expecting a multi-line answer. All right, well, what that would look like is basically for each of our questions, we would want to check and see if the question is multi-line or not. All right, so what this might look like is for every question, we would want to check whether it's multi-line or not. All right, so we could say something like uh, if question dot multi-line, and then we would say else, and the current code would go inside else because that would be for single line questions, all right? So for the multi-line questions, what we would want to do is we would want to ask the question, but then we would want to keep looping through and allowing the user to enter in new lines, all right? So what that might look like is we could say something like let response lines equals empty array. And then we could just do something like, uh, you know, if we just copy this do while loop down here, there we go, I'll just uncomment that and cut it. And we could paste it inside that if statement. Okay, and we'll just adjust the indentation here. There we go. Oh, one more I need to do. And then after we've gathered all of the lines, right after the user enters an empty string as one of the lines, what we would wanna do is just add that response to our responses object, all right? So we could say responses uh, question dot key equals response lines. And we could set that either to an array or we could just join that together by saying dot join. And probably the best way to join this together would, would be to use a new line character so that you keep the original formatting that the user entered. Okay, 
So now that we've done that, let's try using our multi-prompt function. And what this is gonna look like is we're just going to remove the rl.on. Feel free to leave that around for yourself if uh, you want it for reference. And what we're gonna do here is say let responses equals, and then we'll say await. And our function was called multi-prompt. So we'll say multi-prompt, and we'll call that with the questions array that we created. And that's pretty much all we need to do, right? Let's just log out the responses that we get by saying console.log responses, and that should be the end of our program. So let's try running this now, and we'll see what's your first name, Sean, what's your middle initial, P, what's your last name, Wassell, and tell me about yourself. I'll say, I am a programmer who likes to eat. And then if I hit enter twice, we'll see that that will give us our entire object and that our bio has this multi-line text inside of it. All right, and the only reason that the slash n characters are visible is just because we're printing that out. Basically, this is just multi-line text. So anyway, that's how to collect multi-line input from users in Node.js. We've seen two ways. One way was just by looping through and calling this ask question thing multiple times, which again, under the hood, calls the readline.question function, which we've promisified, so to speak. And the second way was by using uh, readlines on function for listen for when a user enters a new line every time. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. As you've probably noticed by now, almost all of the JavaScript programs that we write and run on the back end using Node.js rely pretty heavily on the console as a way of communicating with us, right? Whether that's getting our input using the readline package or whether that's simply uh, printing out the results of running the program or whether it's, uh, you know, printing out the values of variables inside the program so that we can check and see if the program is running correctly and also try and track down bugs. Now, in most cases, the ability to print out a simple plain string to the console is going to be uh, all that our program needs to communicate with us. But there are going to be certain situations where we'll need to actually uh, print out something a little bit more complex and graphical to the console. Now, in this situation, the ability to quote unquote draw on the console, uh, and in case you're wondering what this looks like, just Google ASCII art, A-S-C-I-I -I art, that is, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Basically, the ability to draw to the console entails using different symbols to draw shapes and letters and that kind of stuff on the console instead of just printing out a plain string. And that's what we're going to be seeing how to do here today. We're going to be seeing how to use uh, JavaScript and how to write backend programs that will actually print out more graphical interfaces to the console. So without further ado, let's jump right in and see how this works. Okay, so to get started here, the first thing that we're gonna do is take a look at some of the most important functions that you're gonna need in order to do things like draw to the console and you know really just be able to fine tune and have a high degree of control over what you're writing in the console so that you can do things like draw squares, write ASCII art, uh, draw colors, that kind of stuff. So the first thing that we're gonna take a look at here is the readline package. Now the readline package is something that we've covered in some other sections already, so I'm not gonna to go too much in detail with it right here, but in case you haven't seen some of the previous videos about this, the readline package basically just makes it easier for us to build interactive terminal applications where we're getting input from the user, we're you know writing out prompts to the console, that kind of thing. So the readline package happens to contain quite a few different functions that will make it much easier to control our output to the console. And that's the first thing that we're gonna be taking a look at here. So to get started, let's import the readline package. And you can do that like this by saying import readline from read line. And just as a heads up here, I'm using Node version 16, but it sounds like in higher versions of Node, 
the way that you import the read line package is actually going to change, right? So you'll have to do something like import all as read line from node colon read line or something like that. All right, so just as a heads up, you might have to do that if you're running a higher version of node than I am. Just something to keep in mind. All right, so now that we've imported the read line package, the next thing that we're going to want to do is take a look at our first function, which is the cursor to function. All right, so one major task when we want to be able to control the output that we're writing to the console is the ability to move our cursor to an arbitrary part of the console, right? Because uh, currently the most commonly used console function, which is console.log, this is a very specific function for doing a very specific task, and that is writing some kind of information out to the console, right? So if you wanna say uh, running the program like so, then that's all you really need to do. And basically this function just combines writing this out to the console with adding a new line and all that kind of stuff. All right, so the console log function, which we've been using in pretty much all of the videos is meant specifically for just logging information out to the console without any regard to formatting or uh, you know writing it in a specific place or giving us the ability to print on the same line later on in the program. All right, so as we can see, if we run this program, we're just gonna see running the program and that neatly prints this string on its own line. All right, so that's all that console log is supposed to do. So if we wanna do something a little bit more advanced, generally the way that this is gonna start off is positioning the cursor somewhere in our console window here. All right, and that's basically what the cursor to function allows us to do. It allows us to take this thing and move it to a specific position inside the console window so that we can start writing from there instead of starting to write from wherever the cursor happened to be. So before we talk about that though, let's talk about the way that positions are gonna work in this console window. Okay, the way the positions work in the console window is you're gonna have two axes the first is going to be the y-axis, which goes up and down, and the direction of the y-axis in the console is going to be down, right? So in other words, this up at the top is going to be zero, and this down at the bottom is going to be, you know, whatever the height of your console happens to be. And that is going to change, by the way, as you, you know, adjust the size of the console, adjust the size of the text, etc. Okay, so that's the y-axis. I'll just write that here. The x-axis, which is at the top, goes from the left-hand side over to the right-hand side. So zero is gonna be at the left-hand side and whatever the width of your terminal is, is going to be the value over here on the right-hand side. So that's the x-axis. Now, a position in the console is just gonna be a pair of x and y. So, you know, let's just say that your console is 50 x wide by, let's say 40 y tall. Right, so 50 wide by 40 tall, and you wanted to put something in the middle, well, that would be 25, 20 would be that point there, more or less, right? And I have no idea if that's the correct sizing for this or not, but that would be the position of this point in your terminal. All right, so that would be the coordinates that we would pass to the cursor to function when we use it, which I'll show you how to do in just a minute. So the last thing that I want to mention, though, is how the X and Y are actually measured, right? Are they measured in pixels? Are they measured in percentages? How are they measured? Well, the way that they're measured is by the size of this cursor here. All right, so you see this little box that is our cursor. Basically, the width of this is going to be one X unit, we'll call it, and the height of this is going to be one Y unit. All right, and one thing to notice is that these aren't necessarily equal. In fact, they're just not equal, right? All right, so in general, the Y direction is going to be taller than the X direction. And that's something to keep in mind when we start drawing shapes and that kind of thing. So in other words, if you wanted to find out how far across the terminal was, what you're asking is how many of these cursors is it across? And, or stated differently, how many characters across could you type? So, you know, if you were to just hold down the dash character and go all the way across, how many dashes is that? All right, so that's basically the X size of your console. And, you know, the height of that, if you were to just draw the pipe character, let's say all the way down, that would be the Y height of your console. All right, so anyway, that's how the console positioning works. So let's go back to our cursor to function. Our cursor to function 
All that it's going to do, it's a very simple function. And by the way, you can call it right off of the read line package by saying read line dot cursor two. The way that this works is it takes three main arguments. The first one is going to be the output that you want to actually move the cursor in, right? So this could be a file or in our case, it's just going to be standard out, which is the console, right? So in our case, the uh, argument for this will almost always be process dot standard out. Okay, now as far as the other two arguments, these are just going to be the X and Y position that we want to move the cursor to. So if we say zero, zero, that's going to put the cursor in the top left hand corner. And you know, if we were to find out the width and height of our terminal and pass those as arguments here, that would put it in the bottom right hand corner. So for now, let's just uh, put the cursor at zero, zero and see what happens if we run our code. All right, so I'm just going to run it here. And what we're going to see is that it looks like nothing really happened. All right. So if you want to see something happen instead of zero, zero, which I kind of forgot about, let's do something like 10, 10. All right. So we're going to put this at the point 10, 10 in our terminal. So let's try this again. What we're going to do is say node index.js and hit enter is that sure enough, the cursor is right here and then our program ends. So then we just see the terminal prefix right here again. All right. So. The thing to notice here is that unless you actually do something with the cursor, like, you know, print out a string, it's not really going to do very much. It's just going to move the cursor and then the program is going to end. So let's try doing something more exciting with the cursor. Let's try writing out our name. All right. And you can use your name. I'm going to use my name. Now, your first inclination here might be to use the console.log function and just say something like Sean. Right. So let's run this and see what happens. Well, what we're going to see is that that actually does work, right? Our name has been printed out nicely down here at the coordinate 10, 10 in the terminal. And in case you're wondering, the S here is going to be at 10, 10. All right. So this here is the original position that we saw the cursor at before. All right. Now the problem with using console.log in situations like this, after we've moved the cursor is that as we saw before, it'll actually cause a new line to appear. So if we say console.log Sean and console.log Sean one after the other, well, what we'll see when we run that is that Sean will be here and Sean will also be here. And that's not necessarily what we want, right? Generally, when we're taking the trouble to actually position our cursor like this, we want the cursor to stay there. We don't want the cursor to just jump down to the next line every time we call console.log. And it's for that reason that instead of using console.log in situations like this, we're going to use process.standardout.write instead. All right. So if we say Sean here, and then we do that same thing and say process standard out dot right again and run our code. What we're going to see is that that puts the two Sean's next to each other. All right. So when we say process dot standard out dot right, it's not going to automatically insert a new line for us. And we can see that the cursor ends at this position here when we're done. Okay. So that's the position that the cursor was at when we finished. So there are a few things to notice about the process dot standard out dot right function. We already saw that it doesn't add a new line after we call it. So if we call process.standardout.write two or three or four times in a row, unless it reaches the very edge of our terminal here, it's not going to jump down to the next line. All right. Is that as we print something out, the cursor position is actually going to move over to the right one for each letter that we write out, right? So um, if we just write out a single letter, our cursor X position is going to move over to the right one. So that's just something to keep in mind as well, uh, because, you know, if you wanted to do something like draw an ASCII square with pipe symbols and uh, dashes, let's say, you're going to have to keep in mind that after every character you write, the cursor is going to jump over one, right? So you're not going to want to write this character out and then just move straight down because the cursor will now be one box over to the right after writing this symbol to the console. All right. So that's just something to keep in mind. So. With what we know already with the read line dot cursor two and the process dot standard out dot right, we can start to do some kind of interesting thing. So for instance, we could potentially draw a line by using a for loop and the way that that would work. I'm just going to start over here. Let's say that we just want to draw a horizontal line using the pipe symbol. All we'll have to do is say let current X, and this is going to be the current X position of our cursor. And we'll start that off at zero or you know what? We'll start it off at like two or something like that. 
And then we'll say something like let uh, line length, and this will be the length of the line that we want to draw, okay? All right, so what we're gonna wanna do now is just loop through, and for this we'll use a while loop, and we'll say while well, current x is less than line length, uh, and we'll add two to that for the starting position. All right, so while that's true, what we're gonna wanna do is set the cursor position to the current x position and some arbitrary y position. Let's just pick 10, I suppose. So we'll say read line dot cursor two, and again, we'll say process dot standard out for the thing that we're writing to here. And then for the position, we're gonna say for the x, we'll say current x, and for the y position, we'll just say something like 10, all right? Just arbitrarily. All right, so now that we've moved the cursor there, the next thing that we're gonna do is we're going to draw the pipe symbol. So for that, we'll just say process.standardout.write, and we're just going to print the pipe symbol. And then what we're gonna do is we're just going to increment the current x by one. And I'm realizing right now that I had this completely backwards thing. Since we wanna draw a vertical line, this should be current y, this should be current y, and current y and x should be drawn the other way around. I was getting myself confused somehow, so we'll just pick an arbitrary x position and current y. You probably realized that before I did, so congratulations. And now that we've done that, let's try writing this again and incrementing the current y. So we'll say current y plus equals one. Okay. So now that we've done that, that should successfully draw a vertical line and we can test this out by opening up our terminal and let's just expand this all the way to give ourselves the maximum amount of space. And if we say node index.js here, we'll see that sure enough that draws a vertical line from position two, right? You can see here the two lines that that's jumping over and it draws 10 pipe characters all the way down to the bottom. Okay, so perhaps you're already starting to get some ideas for things that you can do with this. And really from here on out, it's just gonna be a lot of different combinations of moving the cursor and writing some kind of different character to draw something interesting to the console. Okay, so hopefully this is making sense so far. The next thing that it's gonna be important for you to know is how to erase things in the console, right? So in other words, um, every time that we run our code, this console prefix, as well as the command that we just wrote, are gonna be in the way, right? Because they're already drawn there to the console. So what we're gonna to wanna to do usually is clear this line. And to do that, you're gonna use the read line packages built-in clear line function. Now what that's gonna look like, and you know, you'll usually just call that up here at the top by saying read line, and we'll say something like dot clear line. And we're gonna to have to pass the argument zero. I'll discuss what that argument means in just a second, but let's try running our code again and see what that does differently. Okay, so let's run it here. And oops, it looks like we uh, forgot an argument. The clear line function, just like our cursor two function, is gonna need the process.standard out as its first argument so that it knows where to clear the line. All right, so now that we've added that, let's try this again. You're gonna to wanna to put your terminal up to the very top and let's try this again. And what you're gonna see is that this is all still there. Now, the reason for this is that when you press enter to enter this command, right? When you press enter to run your code, the cursor is automatically gonna move down one line to the next line, right? So the line that we're actually clearing is this line here when we call readline.clearline. So in order to put it up at the very top and remove the console prefix, we're gonna need to say readline.clearline cursor two and set our cursor to the very top line by saying process.standard out. And then we'll say zero, zero, all right? So we're positioning it at the very top left. And now what we'll see if we run our code is that sure enough, it clears that line for us, right? So we have these two lines up at the top that are empty and we have this vertical line made of pipe symbols that we've drawn all the way down. Okay. so. That's how you clear lines. So the next thing that you might be wondering is how do we clear the entire console, right? So, you know, if we have some commands already run here, what you're gonna notice if we run our code again is that the line gets drawn over top of everything, right? Which is usually not what we want. So in situations like this, we're usually gonna want to clear out 
the entire console before we draw something. Now, the way that you do that is actually not with a specific read line function, but by writing a specific character to the console. Now, just as a warning ahead of time, writing these characters is gonna become a pretty frequent thing, especially when we get into doing things like drawing colors to the console. All right, so with that warning, the way that we clear the entire console in Node.js, and this is just one way of doing it, so you could obviously just loop through all the Y positions and call clear line if you wanted to, but that's kind of time consuming. An easier way is just to call, and here I'll do this up at the top, process.standardout.write, and what you're gonna be writing is the following character, and you have to type this out exactly for it to work. It's gonna be slash lowercase u 001b, okay? And then an opening square bracket 2j, capital J that is, and then same thing, slash u 001b, and then after that, opening square bracket 0 semicolon 0 F. And no, I'm not joking, that is the character. You're just gonna want to create a constant for that or something. Um, in fact, let's just do that right here so that I never have to type that again. Up at the top, we'll just say const and something like clear console equals, and then we'll just assign that there so that we don't have to worry about that anymore. All right, so now we can just say process.standardout.write and we're going to print out that clear console string and what that will do is actually clear the console. So let's make a mess of our console here. And oh, it looks like I accidentally ran a command here, but that's perfect because that makes a mess. So let's try running this again. If we run node index.js and hit enter, we can see that that will successfully clear all of that stuff and draw our nice little line here. So that's how you clear the entire console for a drawing, which is gonna be very helpful if we wanna do things like create console games and draw ASCII art, that kind of stuff. So anyway, those are pretty much all of the important functions that you're gonna to need to know about. Oh, and another thing that I wanted to mention is this zero for readline.clearline. Basically, this is just an argument that tells readline what side of the current cursor position you want to clear, right? So, you know, if your cursor is right here, do you wanna clear everything to the left-hand side? Do you wanna clear everything to the right-hand side? Or do you wanna clear everything to both sides, right? To both the left-hand and right-hand sides. The way that that works is, is zero means that you wanna clear everything to both the left-hand and right-hand sides. Negative one means that you only wanna clear the left-hand side and one means you wanna clear everything to the right-hand side, okay? Now, I don't expect you to know that. Usually, you'll wanna clear the entire line, so I would just say zero there um, as a default. But we don't even need that line anymore because we cleared the entire console, so that's just something to keep in mind for later on, okay? So there is actually one last thing that I wanna talk about, and it's not a function, but it's a property that is going to be very useful for us because we saw earlier that the height of the console can vary quite a bit depending on, you know, the terminal size in our IDE and also depending on the size of the text, right? So, you know, we could have some very small text like this or we could have our text size very large like this and, that, and that's gonna make a very big difference in the size of our console in terms of X and Y. So in order to find out the size of our console, we're gonna look at two properties and those properties are process.standardout.rows and process.standardout.columns. And these are gonna return the exact size in, um, I suppose, cursor units of the terminal. Okay, so we can print this out right now if we want to. Let's just say something like console.log and in back ticks we'll say the terminal is currently, and then we'll say process.standardout.columns. All right, that's the X position, and then we'll say by, and then we'll do process.standardout.rows, which is the Y size. And if we print that out now, we'll see that it says the terminal is currently 94 by 17. So you can see that in the X direction here, the dimension is generally gonna be a lot bigger than in the Y direction. Because A, I mean, the window really is wider than it is tall, but also the units that we're using are gonna be different in either direction, right? I would say it's almost, if not exactly, twice as high as it is wide. 
So anyway, those are the main functions and properties that you're gonna need to know about in order to draw effectively in the console. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've seen all of the basic functions that are gonna be necessary for drawing to the console, let's put ourselves to the test and see if we can draw a square. All right, this is gonna be a pretty interesting task, so let's just jump right in. Now, the first thing that we're gonna to need to do here is, as we've seen before, we're gonna to need to clear the screen so that we're starting with a blank slate, all right? Now, the second thing we're gonna to wanna to do is obviously draw the square. And this is basically going to involve drawing two vertical lines and two horizontal lines. And the vertical lines, of course, are just gonna be pipe characters and the horizontal lines are just gonna be dashes. Okay, so let's start off here by just drawing a square that's something like, I don't know, let's say 10 by 10. We'll just give ourselves an easy number to work with. So what we're gonna need to do here is we're gonna want to clear the console which we've already done here with our clear console character and saying process.standardout.write. And the next thing that we're gonna to wanna to do is I suppose we'll just move our cursor to the top left-hand corner because uh, you know that's as good a place as any to start our square. And once we've done that, it's pretty much just gonna be looping through and drawing the sides of the square. So we'll start off here by saying something like, uh, I don't know, let side length equals 10. And then what we'll do is we'll say let current x, which we can just shorten to x, I suppose, equals zero, and let y equals zero. And this will help us keep track of where we are in the terminal, right? Where our cursor is in the console. So we're gonna wanna start out, of course, by drawing a vertical line straight down from our current position. So what that's gonna look like is we're just gonna say, well, x is less than side length, all right, so it's gonna go from zero all the way to nine. What we're gonna to wanna to do is set our cursor to the current X position and current Y position, which we'll just call X and Y. And we're gonna want this to be Y since we wanna draw the vertical line first. And then we're just going to loop through and work our way down drawing pipe characters along the way and incrementing Y as we go. So now that we've done that, right, we've drawn the vertical line from the top to the bottom, and, and we can actually see this, by the way, if we run our code, right, we'll just see that we draw a vertical line starting at zero, zero, oops, starting at zero, zero here and going 10 units down. And by the way, if you wanna get rid of this terminal thing here or show it at the very bottom of the screen, what you can do is at the end of the program, you can set the cursor position to the very bottom of the console. So what that'll look like is we'll say, readline.cursor2, and we're gonna say process.standardout, and the X position in this case will be zero, but the Y position will be process.standardout.rows, and I believe we'll wanna say minus one here, because we want the cursor to still be inside the console. So let's try running this again, and what we should see is that sure enough, that causes our terminal to start off at the very bottom so that we can see our entire drawing after it's been completed, okay? So we've got one side of the square drawn and we've got our console prefix down at the bottom after we run our program. So let's start drawing the next side. And this is just going to somewhat arbitrarily be the bottom edge of the square just because that's where our cursor currently is. So for this next side, what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna want to draw dashes all the way across. So this is gonna look very similar to our previous while loop. We'll just say while x is less than side length. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say read line dot cursor two, and we're gonna to want to say process dot standard out. And then we'll say x and y. And what we're gonna to wanna to do each time is say process dot standard out dot write. And we're gonna write the dash character instead of the pipe character. Okay, and as we go, we're going to increment X, of course, which will take us all the way across. So let's try this now. We're going to open up our terminal again and run our code. And sure enough, we'll see that we have both sides of our square, which is absolutely not a square because of the size differential in unit. So what you might wanna do 
is uh, add some kind of adjustment factor for the side length when you're dealing in the x direction, right? So you might want to say x is less than side length times 2 or something like that. And if we did that, we should see that that would make it a little bit more square. Not quite, but close enough. Okay? Now the other thing to notice too is that in the corner here, we're overwriting our final pipe character, which may or may not be what we want. But what you could do if you wanted to avoid that would be simply to increment x before we start drawing the bottom side, right? So you could just say x plus equals 1. And if we run this again, we'll see that that actually makes it look a little bit better in my opinion. Oh, and uh, one more thing. That's not actually what was happening. I said that this was getting overwritten as if there used to be a pipe character there and we were just overwriting it with a dash. But that's actually not the case. The reason that there's this empty space here now is because we simply increment y after each time we loop through, right? So after we draw that last pipe character, we're simply going to increment y, which is going to put it down one. So what you could actually do if you wanted to would be to uh, subtract one from y, right? We'll just do some kind of adjustment factor and just say x plus equals one and y minus equals one. And if we run this again, we'll see that they're a little bit more in line. Although personally, I'm not a big fan of how this uh, pipe character is hanging over, but whatever. In fact, what you could actually do is for the final character here, right? In the case where y is equal to side length minus one, you could draw a plus sign instead. So let's just see what that would look like. Uh, if we said if y is equal to side length minus one, um, then in that case, we would want to draw a plus sign. Otherwise, we'd want to draw the regular pipe character. So let's just try that here. We'll say process dot standard out dot right. And we would draw a plus sign here as sort of the corner, I suppose. And then if we draw this again, we'll see that that draws a nicer looking corner. Okay, and this is just a brief example of some of the fun things that you get to figure out as you're working on ASCII art. It's it's a whole art, a very, very nerdy art. Um, but anyway, now that we've done that, let's draw our other sides of our square. These ones should be pretty straightforward. What we're going to actually do is the same thing that we did with these other two, right? With while y side length and while x side length. But we're going to do them up at the top and over on the right-hand side, respectively. So what this is going to look like is we're going to start off here by drawing the other horizontal edge. So what I'll do is just copy this. And we'll go down here and paste it like so. And in between those, we're going to set the Y position to zero. Okay. So we're going to start the Y position up at the top of our terminal. So that should be really all we need to do. Let's try this again. And what we should see is if we run node index.js, oops, it looks like there's nothing there. And that's because we have to reset X as well. So we'll have to say X is equal to, and we'll set it equal to one because we don't want it to write over this uh, other pipe character there. So let's try running this again. And sure enough, what we'll see is that we have the top edge of our square. Okay, now the same thing is going to apply for this other pipe character here. If we wanna replace that with a plus sign, we can. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna go up to the top here in our initial y while loop. And we'll say if y is equal to side length minus one, or we'll say if y is equal to zero. Okay. In both of those cases, we're going to draw a plus sign. So let's try that again. And sure enough, we're getting a pretty nice looking square there, if I do say so myself. So the last thing now is going to be to draw another line on this side here. So in order to do that, we're just going to copy the while loop from the very top. And we're going to need to, of course, set X and Y to appropriate values before that. So we'll paste that here. And then we'll say x is equal to 10. I believe that's it. We can always adjust that after. And y is equal to 0. All right, so the idea here is that this is going to do the same thing and draw another vertical line over on the right-hand side of our square. And uh-oh, it doesn't look like that's quite right there. Let's, um, oh, that's because x was doubled, so we need to set that to 20. All right, so let's try that again. And we end up with a square, and it's a pretty good looking square if I do say so myself. So anyway, that's how to draw a simple square using the functions that we learned with readLine. And just as a reminder, we saw not only how to write individual characters, but we also saw how to do things like clear the entire screen and 
set our cursor to a given position. And all of this together allowed us to draw a shape in the console. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so at this point, we've been able to successfully draw a square to the console, but first of all, our code is kind of a mess. And when I say kind of, I mean, it's a lot of a mess. And the second thing is that our drawing process really isn't very flexible, right? So let's say we wanted to move our square over a few units or down a few units or draw it a different size. Well, currently there's not really any way to go about doing that which is unfortunate. So what we're gonna be taking a look at here is we're gonna see how to refactor all of this code into a single function called something like draw square, something like that, that will allow us to draw squares at different positions and of different sizes. So I guess let's just start off by creating our function. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say function draw square and right off the bat, let's just think of a few things that we'll want to uh, be able to specify about our square. Now, obviously we're gonna wanna define where our square is actually being drawn, right? So we'll call that like the uh, start X and the start Y. That'll be the origin, so to speak, of our square, the top left corner. And we're also gonna wanna be able to specify the height and uh, well, width, I guess would be the same in a square, but I guess just to make this a little bit more flexible, let's just say draw rectangle and that'll be the name. And then we'll be able to specify the width and height. Okay. So those are really the four things that we're going to want to be able to specify where the top left corner is of our square. And you could also rewrite the code slightly to be the center of the square if you wanted to. And we're also going to want to specify how big our rectangle is in each dimension. Okay, so to get this started, what we're gonna wanna do is probably start in the top left corner like we did and you know, just start from there. It'll just make it easier. But before we do that, let's stop and think about what actually goes on when we draw our square. And oops, I was trying to run that and draw the square again, but uh, we'll just have to think about it in our minds because the code isn't working right now. So if you think about a square, a square is really just four lines being drawn with their start and end at specific points. So one thing that we could do to make this code that we're writing in our draw rectangle function a lot more reusable and also simpler would be if we first created a function called, I don't know, draw line or something like that, that would actually take care of the logic of drawing a line. Right? And you probably noticed that there's a lot of repeated logic for all of our while loops here because in each case, we're just drawing a line, all right? so. What we're gonna do is we're gonna create two more functions. The first one will be called something like draw vertical line. Okay, we're gonna have separate functions for vertical lines and horizontal lines just because that's easier. And uh, the three arguments that we're gonna wanna specify for the line will be the starting X, the starting Y, and the length of the line. Okay, and we're gonna have a similar function called draw horizontal line. And that will have the same things, right? So the X start, the Y start, and the length of the line. Now, in case you're wondering why we're not drawing uh, diagonal lines, that's just because getting that to look right with ASCII characters is a little bit more complex than drawing vertical and horizontal lines. So just to keep things a little bit simpler, we're gonna stick to vertical and horizontal lines for now. All right, now, one thing that we're going to specify here for all the lines that we draw with these two functions is that Regardless of whether they're vertical or horizontal, we're gonna have the line start with a plus sign, and this will make it so that corners look right when we actually join up lines like so, okay? So that's the idea. We're gonna have our vertical lines and horizontal lines start and end with plus signs, and in between they'll be either pipe characters or dashes. Okay, and this will make, as you'll see, our rectangle much easier to draw since we won't have to worry about all of this other logic as we're doing so. Okay, so for drawing a vertical line, the first thing we're gonna wanna do is start off at the X start and Y start position. So we'll say readline.cursor2, and we're gonna wanna set the cursor 
to the x start and y start. And the first argument here is going to need to be process.standard out, of course. And the first thing that we're going to want to do is draw the beginning plus sign. So we'll say uh, process.standardout.write. And we're going to draw a plus sign there. And we're going to want to end the line by doing that as well. So we'll just add that same line of code here after the while loop that we're going to draw. Okay, so after we've drawn the first plus sign, we're going to want to say well. And then in order to keep track of the current position that we're drawing at, we're going to want to keep track of the current Y position. So we'll say, um, let current Y. And in fact, just to keep things a little more consistent with the naming convention, we'll say Y current and have it reversed and say uh, that that's equal to Y start plus one because we've already drawn the plus sign at this starting position here. All right, so we're just setting Y current to Y start plus one so that we can start off uh, after the plus sign. All right, so now what we're gonna do is just loop through as long as Y current is less than Y start plus length. And I'm realizing right now that I spelled vertical wrong. That should be C-A-L. And uh, back to the while loop, as long as Y current is less than Y start plus length, we're gonna want to draw pipe characters. So we'll say process.standardout.write pipe. Oops, there we go. That's it. And we're going to want to increment y current. So we'll say y current plus equals one. Okay. And once we reach the end, we're going to draw that last plus sign there. And before we do that, actually, we're going to want to make sure that the cursor is at the right position since the default position will be right next to the last pipe character that we drew here. So we'll want to say readline.cursor2, and then we'll want to say x start and y current. And that's where we'll draw the final plus sign. So just to make sure we have everything right here, let's test out this vertical line function on its own. And what we're going to want to do for that is just remove all of this other code, all of this messy square code that we had from before. And we're going to leave this readline.cursor2 uh, call down here because remember that resets the console prefix and puts it at the bottom so that it doesn't get in the way. And let's just call draw vertical line here. And let's try drawing a vertical line starting at, I don't know, maybe two and three. And let's make the line, uh, I don't know, 15 units long. All right. So if we run our code here, what we should see is that it draws a vertical line, but that's clearly not what's happening here. Um, in fact, what's happening there is um, we're drawing a horizontal line instead. And the only reason that that's happening is because we forgot to call readline.cursor2 inside this while loop. So we'll say readline.cursor2, and we'll want to say process.standardout, and then we'll want x start and y current. And that should fix that behavior that we were seeing. So let's try this again. And sure enough, we see that we get this nice line and uh, the line is a little bit long. So let's maybe extend this a little bit and try again. And sure enough, we see that we get a line. So let's just see where this line is at since it should be according to our uh, function call here at two, three. So we see that it's at X equals two because we have zero, one, two. All right, so that's good. And it should be at three. So we should have, if we start from the top here, zero, one, two, and three. Okay, so the starting point is at the right place. So let's see if our length is correct. Now the length should be 15, which means that there should be a total of 15 segments here. So let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and it looks like we have 16. So uh, the only thing that we have to change there, we're just not stopping early enough in our while loop. We just want to stop when it's y start plus length minus one, okay? And if we run this again, we should see that this now has 15 units. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, okay? So our vertical line is now the right length and at the right position. 
So we should be able to leave that for now and let's move over to our horizontal line. Now the horizontal line logic is gonna be pretty similar. So I'm just gonna copy this. All we're really gonna to have to do is swap out the Y's here for X. So what we'll do is we're going to keep the cursor to and the uh, plus sign the same. And then we're gonna say X current equals X start plus one. And then we're gonna say, well, X current is less than X start plus length minus one. We're gonna say X current and Y start and move the cursor there. We're gonna draw a dash instead of a vertical pipe symbol. And instead of Y current, we're gonna say X current. And we're gonna to have to make that same swap here with X current and Y start. And that should be it, all right? So let's try our draw horizontal line function now. We're gonna do the same thing, but we're just gonna switch out draw vertical line with draw horizontal line. Like so, and, oops, I spelled that wrong too, horizontal, like that. So let's open our console now and try and run this. And what we should see is that we have, well, it's a much shorter line because again, the X units are gonna be smaller than the Y units, but let's just count this anyway. We see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. All right, so our horizontal lines are the right length, and you can check that this is at the correct position if you want to, but I'm just going to assume that it is since we copied and pasted that code from our vertical line uh, code, and that worked as we saw. So now that we can draw horizontal and vertical lines, let's combine this all in our draw rectangle function. So one thing to keep in mind is that our draw rectangle function would have been pretty complicated since it basically would have just had all of this logic repeated twice that we just put in our vertical and horizontal line functions. So um, this should be considerably simpler uh, just using those other smaller functions that we uh, just defined in our draw rectangle instead of writing all the code from scratch. So let's draw our rectangle. And in order to do this, we're just gonna have to draw two vertical lines and two horizontal lines. And we're gonna have to obviously use these arguments and translate them so that it makes sense for our lines. So let's start off here by drawing our vertical lines. What we're gonna do is just say draw vertical line. And for X start and Y start, the first line, this is gonna be the same as the draw rectangle, right? This is gonna be the top left corner. So this here will be X start and Y start as the starting point for the line. And the actual length of the vertical line is going to be the height argument here. Okay, so we're just gonna say draw vertical line, X start, Y start, and height. And that should draw the left-hand side vertical line. So for the other vertical line, we're gonna say draw vertical line, and the Y start is gonna be the same here because you know, if we have the other corner up here and we've already drawn that line like so, we're gonna to wanna to draw the other line at the same height over here, right? So the X start is gonna be the same. What's gonna be different will be the Y position and that's going to be whatever the original Y start position was plus the width, okay? So what that's gonna look like, we're just gonna say X start plus width, and then we're gonna say Y start as the Y position, and the length is gonna be the same as before, it's going to be the height. All right, so to check if this is working so far, let's try calling our draw rectangle function by saying draw rectangle, and we'll start this off with X start and Y start as two and three, and we'll give this a width of, I don't know, let's say, uh, we'll, we'll do a small number just to make this easier to count. So we'll say seven, as the width and we'll do 10 as the height. So let's try this now. We're gonna run our code. And sure enough, we see two vertical lines right next to each other. Now the width here was supposed to be uh, seven. So let's just count and see if that's correct. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it looks like we went one too far. Let's just, uh, go up into our draw rectangle, and this should be X start plus width minus one, just to make sure it lines up with our horizontal lines. So let's try this again, and we should see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, 
So now all we have to do is draw our horizontal lines, and this is gonna be pretty much the same logic as we had with our vertical lines, but obviously horizontal. So we'll say draw horizontal line. We're gonna start off with the top one, which is gonna start at X start and Y start, and it's going to have the length of width. So let's try running this just to make sure it lines up, and sure enough, it does. The plus signs and everything line up nicely. And the last one is going to be draw horizontal line, X start and Y start plus height minus one, okay? So basically, again, the same thing that we did with our X start plus width minus one, but in the Y dimension. So let's try this again. We're gonna run it, and sure enough, we end up with a nice rectangle here with all of the right dimensions. So now that we've completed this draw rectangle function, let's just draw a few more rectangles. We'll just say draw rectangle and we'll start this one at 10 and um, I don't know, 21 maybe, and we'll make it five by five. We'll do draw rectangle 20 and uh, let's say seven, and we'll make this 20 by 20. And we'll do this other one and we'll do 20 and uh, 30 and we'll make it, uh, I don't know, 10 by 10. Okay, so let's run this now. And sure enough, we see our rectangles are all here, except it looks like they went a little bit over what the height of our thing could handle. So let's just, uh, let's try zooming out here and try drawing that again. So we'll say clear and we'll try it again. And sure enough, we see all of our rectangles drawn in the console. So anyway, now that we've figured out how to draw lines and rectangles in the console, feel free to try and, uh, I don't know, do things like write words or draw pictures with them. And, you know, obviously you know a lot of other tricks as well. So if you want to figure out how to draw circles or triangles or uh, letters even, feel free to figure that out and create functions for each of those and, and maybe write your name or something. I don't know. The sky is really the limit for you. So hopefully you found this interesting and I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.